Um, so look, to briefly go through this afternoon's uh, format, uh, very shortly, we will have a presentation on an introduction to local government. Then we're going to have a, a conversation around the whole area of active uh, citizenship, engagement and participation. And then the final part of this afternoon's um, session, we're going to have a panel discussion, a Q&A uh, with a number of the female elected members of Kerry County Council uh, who have generously given up their time here um, this afternoon. So as part of that session, uh, people were invited to uh, submit some questions which we hope we're going to go through as well this afternoon but also there'll be an opportunity for people from the, the floor to ask um, some questions and, and to, to, to go through any questions and queries or whatever that they have. Um, our plan if everyone's in agreement with this is we'll keep the afternoon session moving. Um, I know that around three o'clock um, people will get a top up of their teas and coffees um, so we're going to keep the session moving this afternoon um, with the objective that we could maybe would finish around quarter past half past um, four. So without further ado, I'm going to ask for uh, Padre Corkery to join us. Padre is the um, SEO in Corporate Affairs and Padre, um, along with Christy O'Connor, who also joins us here this afternoon, the Director of Services for Corporate Services, um, are going to talk to us about local government and specifically they're going to look at a number of different topics around what Kerry County Council does, um, the executive functions, I suppose very much uh, lo looking as well at the decision process within Kerry County Council because um, we we often hear, well, how how was that decision come to? So uh, understanding how different decisions and so on have been made. Talking um, as well about the strategic policy committees, um, the uh, local government management, the municipal district areas, and I suppose looking at the whole area of uh, municipal districts, the full council meeting and the notice of motions and how that process actually works, and also the election and nomination uh, process. So we're very much looking forward to hearing what uh, Padraig and Chris have to say this afternoon and then after their presentations we'll also um, have an opportunity to ask uh, some questions. So I think Padraig is going to join us first so a very warm welcome to Padraig. Uh, thank you very much, Breed, and um, very welcome everybody here today. It's uh, I note the irony of a white male starting off the, the presentations here today, but uh, no, I, I suppose as you'll see there, I suppose from the executive point of view anyway, um, the amount of uh, participation by women in, in Kerry County Council is significant, not least our chief executive to start off with, uh, other members of our senior management team are head of finance our county solicitor and our director of community uh, and economic development. So um, at the top table, there is a significant um, um, input and uh, membership, female mem uh, membership of the senior management team. So I suppose, as Breed said, I'll just give you a quick rundown of the whys and the wherefores and the what fors, etc. So bear with me here. Have I? There we go. Yeah, look, I suppose I'll outline briefly the, the, the vision of Kerry County Council and I'll show you more capital over them. Um, I suppose the vision of Kerry County Council, it's set out in our corporate plan. Why do we do what we do and what's our role in the county? Uh, our role really is we're the main vehicle of governance and public service at local level. Uh, we lead economic, social and community development, deliver efficient and good value services and represent citizens and communities as effectively and accountable as possible. So that's really our raison d'etre what we do in the county, it's for the people of the county, it's for visitors to the county, it's for communities, um, businesses in the county, the business sector. Our role really is to um, put in place an environment, um, a network, um, I suppose the ground where um, all these can grow and prosper, ensure that our communities are safe and healthy and we do so in a manner that um, I suppose engenders public trust. Um, is done with um, value for money um, and that we deliver public service in the best way possible. And our mission statement sets that out as well. We lead the economic, social and cultural improvement of our county in a sustainable manner to make our county a great place to live, visit, learn, work, do business and invest. We will honour the past and embrace the future, recognising our unique cultural, social and sporting heritage in our Gwildet. Gokro, the Svede Aryenov, Consuel Nadine, Nanina, Oxen, the Gurtuari, Fiasu. So, 
Coming from that, that's our mission statement, that's why we're here. Coming from that, our core values, I'll run quickly, civic leadership and collaboration, citizen and community focus, respect, honesty and integrity, good governance, innovation and progression and sustainability. So they are all coming from our corporate plan, which is really our mission statement to the county, due for renewal again this year. Um, and we will be working that after the local elections for the, the newer version of that. And that's our strategic objectives, which flow down from that. We deliver excellent public service, promote economic development, support enterprise and employment creation, build strong influential partnerships to maximize the county's position, potential, sustainability, and support to low carbon and leading climate action, organizational, develop organizational capacity, build sustainable infrastructure, and engage the wider community. And even there, you'll see at the bottom, it, a mid-year review of our county development plan. So it was around the time of COVID-19, so our response to COVID-19 was built into that. So fingers crossed we won't have to include that in the next corporate plan. Brief outline of our senior management team, like I said, uh, well represented, our Moira Morrell is our uh, chief executive. And uh, then we have the directors of service who are over all of their various, um, net, over all their various departments and units. That's a bit, oh, sorry, I'll scroll down there. Sorry, that's me. Um, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> Never give a multitask job to a man. <laughs> uh, there is, I suppose, a number, it's just the departments there, and it's quite small. So um, economic and community development, planning, environment and emergency management, finance, housing and human resources, roads, transportation, smart travel, public realm, corporate services, county solicitor, the Ukraine and water services. When I uh, kind of give presentations, as I do on occasion, I give a lot of them to students in sixth class and fifth years, especially TY. Um, I make the comparison that as soon as you get up in the morning, Kerry County Council plays a role in your life uh, all the way through. It used to be better before we lost water services, but it used to be when you turn on your tap and brush your teeth, when you drive to school or get a lift to school or cycle to school, the house you live in, planning permission is required for that. Uh, the roads that you drive on, they're maintained and built by Kerry County Council. If you visit the library after school, it's Kerry County Council. When you come home, if for some unfortunate reason, something unfortunate happens in your house and you need to call the fire service, their Kerry County Council service. So we're included and we're involved in every, engaged in every aspect of your life. And the role of the elected member then, I suppose, is to assist in making those policy decisions and help lead and direct the, um, the, the I suppose, the direction that the services of Kerry County Council provides and the environment that we provide. Moving on to our elected members, the makeup, 33 elected members, five municipal districts, Tralee, Killarney, Listowel, Kinmere, Castle Island, Corcoquina. And I'm quite aware that a number of you here will be hoping to um, be on the list here maybe next time we have this conversation. Um, as you'll see, the, the elected members are set out there, also available on the Kerry County Council website, which is a trove of information on everything. So um, every five years, that's just a map there of the elected the municipal districts. You'll see the one, the pink one, Castle Island, Kirkagwina. Come election time, that will be split into two electoral areas, Castle Island and Kirkagwina. So you will run for one or will run in one or the other, depending on where you're, um, depending where you live. Current picked on by political party, you'll see there, Fianna Fáil, ten of the largest, and we have nine independents. Um, so a significant. I suppose geographically, and it's broken up in terms of parties and independence. There's a significant spread around how we operate. I suppose how we operate and the work that the councillors do and the work that the local authorities do is set out by our parent legislation, and that's the Local Government Act 2001. Uh, council meetings then are brought in under that, Schedule 10, how we meet as a council, third Monday of every month except in August. Meetings that we have to meet, have, we have to have our monthly meeting, except for August, we have to have an annual meeting to elect a Cahir look, budget meeting, and then we have other special meetings that are called for things like county development plans, uh, etc., other important things that come up during the year. The business of the meeting, it's quite simple, and again, if you go onto our council website, you'll see the format of the meeting, it's set out in prescribed format, statutory business, such as financial matters, appointments, all of the business then, we, I suppose, the council meeting allows the executive to give the elected members and 
as well the public an opportunity to report on what the council have done has done over the past month and then finally we've noticed the motions which comes which is the um, an important part for the elected members it allows them to raise issues of interest to their constituents um, and get responses from management council meetings uh, members of the public have a right to attend uh, legal right it's in the legislation the press and the public have the press also have a right to attend like I said our agenda in minutes are up on the website and any documents that we um, circulated the meeting they're considered public documents how do we make our decisions well there's I suppose we'll divide it into two you have reserve function and executive function um, a reserve function are decisions made by the elected members themselves um, made by resolution, they vote on them uh, of the 33 members. The vast majority of decisions are by majority vote. Um, there are one or two other areas where you have to have a certain percentage, be it three quarters and so forth. Um, they're made by resolution and again it's set out by legislation. Again, you have things like the county development plan where it's presented to the members and the members ultimately have the final say on it. Our annual budget, our financial decisions, how we set out, how we're going to fund ourselves and what we're going to fund the following year that's agreed and uh, by the elected members and they ultimately vote on it then you have the other side of the house is an executive function and that's where decisions are made by the council management um, or the staff of the council who are delegated by the chief executive and she they are executive functions the elected members do not have an input into those and the biggest and the easiest example is planning decisions so grants of planning permission, refusals of planning permission, uh, the elected members don't have an input into the decision making process there. The role of the elected members, if those of you who are going, those of you who are sitting here already are aware of it and those who are hoping to come in, um, it's, it's I suppose a representational role to act on behalf of the constituents who elected you and obviously the constituents who didn't vote for you in the, uh, during the elections as well, raise issues on their behalf and um, make queries to the various departments, be it housing, roads, community, um, raise issues, bring issues to the awareness of the elected member, of the executive and the council, or um, ask questions and, and just get responses and pass information. It's a lot of information sharing. Um, the elected members are continually working, sending in emails, making phone calls on behalf of their constituents to, to the various departments and getting responses back. In addition then, they have a policy role. So um, we would, as the exec executive would bring reports and draft policies to the elected members, such as the litter management plan, climate action plan, various bylaws and one that springs to mind, I see Councillor Marie Loney down there, was the, the busking bylaws in Killarney that was brought about and the members debated and eventually um, voted on to adopting them and how to adopt them and so forth. So they have a role in policy development. Obviously the biggest one is the county development plan which sets out the future um, development of the county in terms of um, doing it in a sustainable manner moving forward. Municipal district meetings then, that's the, I suppose we have the plenary council, the full council of the 33 members that meets every month except for August. Municipal districts then, if you remember the map back that a few slides ago, um, that is, they are municipal district meetings, the five municipal districts meet every two months. Um, so if you are elected in the Killarney area, you will attend the Killarney municipal district meeting. They're held locally, they deal with local issues. Um, so um, Tralee Municipal District will deal with issues in the Tralee MD area, Tralee Ardfert or so forth, Castle Island, Cork Green MD will deal with the issues in their area. More local, whereas a lot of the issues debated and spoken about at full council level are more general, they relate to the whole county, be it policy or be it um, decisions that may impact on the, the, the whole county. Municipal district uh, discussions, debates, notices, motions and questions, they really are far more local and um, I suppose it allows the elected members to speak specifically on and to raise issues specifically on the, the areas um, that they have been elected to. They have certain powers, such as Part A planning permissions, again, reserve function, and there is a list of functions, again, in the Local Government Act, which is set out in Schedule 14, where certain decisions and certain issues can be dealt with at the municipal district level. And again, I suppose, because they're raised locally, the hope then is that they wouldn't be dealt with at, at county level. Again, the intention and the hope is that 
it doesn't always go like that, but the intention the hope is that the majority of issues that are local would be dealt with locally and wouldn't need to be raised at county level. Obviously, that's not always the case. Then I suppose you have had your full council, you have your municipal districts, and then there's a number of subcommittees and other types of committees that the elected members um, have membership of. One of them is the strategic policy committees, of which we have five. So this comprises uh, membership of each of these committees is made up of a number of elected members and then a number of members from um, the various sectors. They're not elected members, but they are selected by their various sectors to represent them inside in uh, the various SPCs. And obviously the PPN play a significant role in electing their members, um, in selecting members to represent the PPN and to represent their various sectors throughout. So for example, the housing SPC will have input and will have membership from the approved housing bodies, uh, from the construction sector, um, cultural health, heritage and Gaelic SPC will have um, input from the, the arts uh, sector and from the Irish language sector and so forth. So Economic Development, Enterprise, Tourism, Community, SBC will have input from the, um, the chambers. So they're not elected, but they have an input. What they do then is they discuss broad policy issues and strategy issues, and the idea is that they will bring in through the SBC's matters which may have been raised through full council are di discussed and debated there, given full consideration, and suggestions and proposals are brought forward for the full council. But again, it's, they don't have a decision-making power their power is they discuss policy matters and they bring ideas and proposals and policy suggestions through to full council corporate policy group then is just that's the chairs of the spcs there's five chairs who are all elected members the cahir look and the municipal district where municipal district doesn't have representation uh, they're unrepresented they're represented they're selected they select a representative and that goes on to the um the corporate policy group and realistically they're kind of in the umbrella group over the various SPCs. They link the work of the SPCs. They provide a forum where the different issues raised and the different suggestions and policy ideas brought forward by the SPCs are discussed prior to them coming to, um, I suppose, full council level. They also meet in advance of the council meeting to discuss, I suppose, the um, the agenda that's coming forward and, and um, also discuss areas like performance of local authority and the budgetary process. On top of that, if that isn't enough membership and enough committees for all the councillors, there's a few more. Uh, and this pro probably every June, this happened, June every five years, um, and it will happen once the new council is elected in June. Um, elected members are invited by various external bodies and boards um, to, or Kerry County Council is invited to have representatives who are elected members on these various boards and bodies. So for some of them, and this is just a very short, very short list, Joint Policing Committee, the LCDC, Kerry ETB, um, we have an external audit committee, the Regional Health Forum, Local Traveller Accommodation Consultation Committee, Kerry Airport, McGillicuddy Reeks Forum. That's just a very small number. But what they do, they, uh, I suppose they're appointed by the full council uh, represented elected members are appointed to represent the council on it and they bring reports back to the um, council on an annual basis as to the workings of those various committees. Now, the next one might be a bit small, but it's just I'm pointing out the national and regional context. Um, I suppose we have central government at the top and they, through legislation, provide the framework by which local government operates and as outlined the Local Government Act. Um, the latest, I suppose, big change was 2014 was amended again in 2000 and or 19, sorry, 2014, uh, was the big one, which uh, abolished the town councils and um, set up, uh, I suppose, ensured that local authorities had more of a role in economic development of their various counties. So they erect as issues, policy guidelines, consultations, obviously. We, our parent department is the Department of Housing Planning and Local Government, but obviously we interact with various other committees, groups and departments, for example, our roads and transportation department would be linked in very tightly with the TII Department of Transport in terms of funding for our national and regional roads. Then when you break it down further, there's a regional element to it. So um, there are three new regional assemblies. Kerry is part of the Southern Regional Assembly with Carlow, all the Munsters, uh, Carlow, Wo uh, Wexford, Kilkenny. So basically a line from both Limerick straight across the county there. So we're part of the 
uh, regional assembly. So really the aim of that is to coordinate strategic planning and sustainable development at regional level. So regional spatial economic strategies um, to ensure that there's a linkage between national policies and county policies that they there is, I suppose, they meet in the middle that the regional policies are in line with the national and the county ones. The LGMA, the Local Government Management, Management Association, really is, I suppose, uh, it's an agency of the Department of Housing Local Government. Um, we fund it as local authorities, and really what that does, on a, it takes a sectoral approach to best practice policies, systems, sectoral approach. Uh, very strongly, it is a significant increase now recently uh, in relation to IC, IT. I think we're all aware of the issues that the HSC had over the last while and it has um, sharpened everybody's mind in terms of cyber security, um, promoting shared services. So rather than Kerry County Council uh, operating uh, or developing a system and Cork County Council developing a system that there's more of a shared service element, they advocate and they engage on behalf of the local authority sector with national government. Um, they work, I suppose, support and develop the implementation of relevant government policy. They highlight and raise the awareness of the work we do in local authorities, and they identify emerging issues, provide advice and sectoral support. So really, they're kind of an umbrella body where they provide certain sectoral approaches and sectoral advice and guidance for local authorities. As part of that, uh, I suppose the city, County and City Management Association, the CCMA, this is really, um, I suppose, um, the chief executives from each local authority um, and the assistant chief, chief executives in Dublin City Council, they come together uh, under the CCMA umbrella. And again, they have a number of subcommittees which deal with, you know, the likes of housing, rural development, water, finance, corporate and so forth. And again, they liaise with government departments and other relevant organizations and they obviously have representation in various groups and committees that may have um, an impact on local authorities. So their role really is to drive and to address and to make sure that local authorities and the chief executives have a voice in the development of government policy as well. Um, briefly, let's just finish off with this. Ethics, uh, quite simple. If you're an elected member, if you are fortunate enough to be called out um, by the returning officer on the 8th or 9th of June. Uh, there will be a requirement for, it's the same for staff, it's the same for elected members to uh, comply with the Ethics Act. Uh, part 15 of the Local Government Act sets out an ethics framework for local government for members and staff. Uh, obviously you have areas like uh, Standards and Public Office Act, SIPO, uh, you read disclosure of donations and expenditure, which for those who are looking to um, uh, be elected and looking to be nominated will be supplied with information in relation to that. And again, if staff members, especially in the, the senior staff members in Kerry County Council, um, there's lobbying act applies as well. So the ethics legislation that outlines, you know, there's an ethics and public office act. Uh, members are required to declare an interest and um, they are required on an annual basis to set out a declaration of interest in uh, relation to, um, I suppose, land, property, etc. and do they have any involvement in companies. So the 2001 Local Government Act prohibits a councillor from influencing or seeking to influence the decision of a local authority in any matter with which the local authority is concerned with the performance of his functions. And so whether the councillor is a connected person or not. So realistically, I suppose, Caesar's wife, you have to be um, seen to be doing the right thing. There's a code of conduct for elected members, similar, council employees of one too, and it sets out the principles, standards of conduct, respect, dignity, and equality for councillors uh, in performing their duties and in their relationship. So really, in all cases, you know, it's not what a member might think, but what a member of the public might think, you know, in relation to it. So um, I just finish off on that one because it's an important one. Um, as elected members, the sitting elected members will be fully aware, you know, of their duties. They are representing um, the, el, their constituents. There is a certain level of trust being placed in them by their constituents, and uh, it's appropriate for them to act according to the various codes of conduct. So, Shin Shin, I might hand over to Christina, who might go up on the, um, in relation to the um, local elections. Thank you, Padraig. Uh, welcome to everyone. It's great to see such a 
uh, big crowd here. Um, my name is Christy O'Connor. I'm Director of Corporate Services and ICT with, with Kerry County Council. Um, one of the last slides there, uh, Padraig mentioned, was the ethics and the importance of that. And one of my roles uh, at the current time is I'm ethics registrar. So I deal with the, you know, the, with that general area. And uh, on an annual basis, uh, all elected members have to submit uh, their, their ethics forms. Uh, one other thing that's worth mentioning there is Padraig mentioned the county and the city managers association, the CCMA, and uh, I just want to mention that our chief executive, Myra Morell, is the current chair of the uh, CCMA. So it's a kind of a great honour for the county to uh, to be uh, have the the chair of of that group. Uh, I suppose what I wanted to go into is. Uh, I'm aware that uh, this is leading towards local elections and that, and uh, I, I said I'd, I'd go into the to the process, give you a bit of information in relation to the nuts and bolts, which might be useful uh, for some of you in in relation to to it. So um, the first uh, slide there, actually. <coughs> Sorry, no. What you say? Oh yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Just one other thing there. Okay. Um, anyway, as you probably all know at this stage, the polling day is Friday, the seventh of June. The hours of polling are from seven o'clock in the morning uh, to ten o'clock that evening. Um, in relation to the. Pro Maybe if we could get the overheads on the screen. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Just get my glass of water. I'll come through that to Marie because Chris, if you wanted to, because the day can then be reworked or whatever. If you want to, if you continue on the second half, it's not working. Oh, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, anyway, the, the 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 date for the local election is the seventh of June, and uh, we've recently received, as the the polling date order was uh, made by the minister recently, and along with that, and we've got documentation setting out the process for how the election will be run, uh, and for those interested in in running as candidates, the first area then will be the receipt of nomination papers. So the period for the receipt of nomination papers is from 10 a.m. Uh, on Saturday the 11th of May to 12 noon on Saturday the 11th of, or the 18th of May. So there's a period of a week for the submission of your uh, nomination paper. And the nomination paper is a formal process and the nomination is to be received by the uh, local return the local election returning officer, who's uh, Martin O'Donoghue. And then uh, the closing date is the Saturday. Anyone then that subsequently decides to withdraw, if you're going to withdraw, you have to withdraw by 12 noon on the Monday following that, or else your name appears on the ballot paper. The nom nomination process then. So a person may nominate himself or herself as a candidate uh, or they may be nominated by someone else who is who has to be registered as a local government elector in the in the local electoral area for which they're running. Uh, the nomination papers have to be delivered personally to the local returning officer, and any person who reaches 18 years of age on or before the polling date is eligible to stand for election. Uh, we'll be putting advertisements in the paper shortly or in the, the various media and radios in relation to the nomination process. Then from a practical point of view, it's best to make contact with us in corporate services in the, in the Kerry County Council to arrange a date with the returning officer that when you'll come in and submit your nomination. Uh, that, that, makes, that makes it, you know, streamlines it a bit and, and it makes it easier to run. 
projects, but I suppose the time deadlines for the process are strict and it's essential that all the required documentation and the photos, etc., are submitted by the deadline date and time. So you have to have everything in by the final uh, date on uh, on uh, on the Saturday. And in relation to that, there's two specific times that the 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 uh, the returning officer has to be in place. And one, I think, is it's either Friday morning or Friday afternoon, but also on the Saturday morning of the the. Uh, uh, the final date. So, but I think the best practice is to make contact with us, and we'll arrange a time when you would come in. Um, as I said, you have to use the prescribed uh, nomination paper, and uh, if you're running with a political party, then on that you'll be setting out on that as well. The political party you're running with, and. The, the register of those parties will have submitted to us uh, details, you know, a certificate in relation to same. That's just to cover off the legalities of it. Um, a candidate who is not a, who is not running with a, uh, a registered political party uh, may, if they so wish, include the expression non-party after the name on the nomination party or on the nomination paper. A description such as independent is not permissible. So non-party or you can leave it blank. Uh, uh, so the the name of the registered political party or the expression non-party, if properly is properly included in the nomination paper, must be set specified. So, if you're a non-party candidate, then there are certain requirements that you have to meet as well. So, uh, there's 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 two options. One is you submit a completed statutory declaration. Uh, which is filled in by 15 uh, people who are, uh, I suppose, nominating you or, or assenting to the nomination, and that has to be signed by a commissioner of votes or a peace commissioner, or you know, there's a number of options in it. Or else, the candidate or someone on his or her behalf can lodge a deposit of 100 euro with the returning officer. Now, if you subsequently reach a certain level number of uh, votes. Uh, that would be returnable. If you don't, it wouldn't. Uh, the figures in relation to that will be set out in the documentation, which we'll be giving out, so that'll be fully explained. <clears throat> so, once your nomination paper is submitted, the, the returning officer must rule on the validity of each nomination paper within one hour of its receipt. Uh, and they may rule a nomination paper invalid only if they consider that the nomination paper is not properly made out and signed, or in the case uh, of a, a, a non-party person, shall we say, that the, the, the 15 people haven't signed the documentation or you haven't paid the 100 uh, euro deposit. Um, so, as I said, the, the, the 100 euro uh, must be paid, and it must be paid by the 12 o'clock on the Saturday. The specific requirements in relation to the provision of photographs, and it's important, as I said, and we will be, we will be circulating documentation, we'll have it up on our website as well, setting out the exact requirements, but uh, the a photograph has to be delivered with the nomination paper to the returning officer in digitised for format, along with two identical printed copies. So, two copies and a digital, uh, a digital copy. The photograph must be of good quality and in colour, showing the candidate's full face, head and shoulders only on a light background, and taken to a professional standard. Uh, the photograph must be taken not more than 12 months prior to a polling day, and each copy of the printed photograph must have the candidate's name, candidate's name in it. So that's important, you know. Uh, particularly if if uh, if you're leaving it late in the day to to make your submit your nomination, just make sure you have all the necessary documentation uh, in place. If there's a if you're with a political party, then the the emblems associated with that, with that party will be received by us from the the electoral uh, commission, and uh, we'll we'll have those. Uh, so then, uh, if you're if you've submitted your nomination and you're you're running for election, uh, you can appoint agents to be present at a number 
of uh, events that take place. One is the issuing of the postal ballot papers, which is a, a formal process which will take place in county buildings in, in, in Trelly here. Uh, you can also have agents at polling stations. You can have them for the opening of the postal uh, votes, ballot boxes, and at the counting of votes. And again, there's a, a process in place in relation to the number of agents and, and you know, you have to, th that documentations, whatever, we'll have to be submitted prior to the, uh, prior to the process, but we'll be in touch with people in relation to that. Um, an important uh, element is uh, an act, it's the Local Elections Disclosure of Donations and Expenditure Act 1999. And these, under this act, there's guidelines set out in relation to the spending limits that are in place in relation to the, uh, to the election. And uh, these have to be complied with. Uh, they, they, they deal with donations on one side. So the maximum donation that may, may be ex ex accepted uh, by a member of a local authority or a local election candidate is €1,000. The threshold above which donations must be reported by the candidate is €600. The maximum amount that can be accepted as an anonymous donation is €100. Uh, and uh, a candidate in local election or a, or a member of a local authority who receives a monetary donation must open and maintain a political donations account in a financial institution in the state. So there's, there's very strict guidelines there in relation to the receipt of donations and uh, and how they're managed. And you have to be able to show that that, that, that is done in a proper manner. Uh, so there's a ban on the acceptance of a donation in, ex in excess of 200 euro from a corporate donor unless the donor has been registered with the Standards and Public Office Commission and a statement is furnished uh, to the recipient confirming that the donation has been improved by the corporate donor concerned. That's all to do with transparency and with ensuring that there's proper process in place. So SIPO, the Standards and Public Office Commission, maintain a register of corporate donors. And so if you if you receive a donation from any of these, you, do, you need to have a certificate uh, in relation to it. Uh, there's a ban on the acceptance of any <coughs> cash donation over 200 euro. Uh, and if, if a donation is given to through an, an intermediary, well, the, the identity of the person on whose behalf the donation is made must be provided at the time. And it's an offence not to provide this uh, information. <coughs> so I suppose, uh, I, hope, I hope, I know it's, it's all very technical uh, and that, but I, I, I just feel it's, it's, it's important that you be aware of it. So just to kind of summarise on the, the main uh, responsibilities and, uh, and requirements. So you may appoint an election agent. Uh, you are responsible for the election expenditure uh, they the incur. Uh, you may authorise a person to incur expenditure on your behalf, but you must maintain proper records of the transactions relating to to that expend to that spending during the campaign, and you must not exceed the spending limits that apply in respect of the 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 area in which you're standing. Uh, if you would. If you're with a, a member of a political party, then the donation limits that are set out. Uh, are slightly changed and that the political party uh, is automatically allocated 10% of that uh, spending so uh, because they, they provide a process in the background. Uh, uh, so that's that kind of area. Uh, so I, I went into the donations area there already. Uh, at the end of the, if you're successful as a candidate in the, in the local elections, then by the 5th of September, that's 90 days after, after the polling date, you have to submit a statement of expenditure in the prescribed form, including a statutory, statutory declaration to the local authority, setting out how the, how, uh, the, the, the spending during the process. Uh, and on an annual basis then, you have to submit to the local authority not later than the 31st of January each year a donation statement indicating whether the, during the previous year 
uh, you received a donation, the value of which exceeded 600. So that's an ongoing process throughout the, throughout the year. Um, and uh, you have to furnish with the donation statement uh, a bank uh, a bank document in support which shows the, the the transactions through that account. So that would be uh, a separate account, your personal account would be set up specifically for the uh, political donations or electoral process. Uh, if you're unsuccessful uh, at the election, you have also to submit uh, a statement in relation to the expenditure uh, in the prescribed form, and that has to be done by the 5th of September, and again, the backup documentation from the relevant bank in relation to the... To it. Uh, so, <clears throat> I suppose, what are election expenses? Candidates are required to furnish in person to the local authority within the 90 days if they have incurred uh, election expenses, uh, and and that's election expenses, whether paid or not. So even if they haven't been paid off, you need to to set that out, and that again is in prescribed form, which will be circulating to candidates. Uh, so the the period, uh, what is the period for which election expenses have to be disclosed? That period uh, is set out in law and in relation to the current election, it's the period between the 8th of April and the 7th of June. So it's kicked off already. And uh, election expenses means all expenditure for electoral purposes uh, on the provision of property, goods or services which are for use at the election. So again, we'll be giving guidelines out in relation to that. And it's, and in those guidelines, there's frequently asked questions in relation to the various types of expenses and how they are measured. And if you have any queries on it, you'll be able to link back with us at, at uh, Kerry County Council. I suppose the crucial question in relation to such expenses is whether the property, goods or services were for use at an election uh, and whether their use took place during the, the period of the uh, election. Uh, the limits are set out and they're, they're broken down then in relation to uh, the, the based on the populations and I'll go into those in a second. Uh, so as I pointed out then, uh, the limits set out uh, the level of expenses that the, the maximum level of expenses that you can incur in relation to the uh, in relation to the election process, and as I said, it's whether those are paid or not. It's 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 whatever was spent, and uh, it's important then that these are uh, adhered to. Because if the, if it weren't the case, the limits would be meaningless, and it'd be open to the candidate to pay in advance for a uh, for uh, for uh, different things, and they wouldn't be shown. But that's not the way it works. If it's something that's going to be used during the election period, specified period, well then uh, they, they are, have to be taken into account. Um, so <clears throat> in some cases, uh, it may happen that s stuff would be ordered prior to the specified period, you know, maybe election posters or whatever like that, but the posters, will be used during the election period. So that's just an example of that expenditure would fall for inclusion. Uh, the candidate spending limits. If the local electoral area is in, a pop, is in an area with a population in excess of 35,000, uh, for the non-party person, it's 15,350 is the spending limit. Or if you're with a party, it's 13,815. Local electoral area with a population between 18,000 and 35, its spending limit is 13,600, or with a party, 12,240. Or if the local electoral area with a population of 18,000 or less, well then it's 11,500 or 10,350. So those limits are important. So it's important to know what's the population of your MD that you're running in and that, that you're aware of the spending limits. 
And why that is so important is that there's a, there's the, the legislation is very strict in relation to disqualification and offences and penalties. So if the expenditure limits are contravened, this would be a serious contravention under the Act and would have serious consequences for the candidate subsequently. And uh, you know it could lead to you being disqualified. So it's important to be, make yourself aware of the guidelines, what's in them, and what you, when, what you can spend and when you can spend it, and ensure you adhere to that. Uh, just in relation to posters, uh, there's a timing place in place in relation to putting up posters, and you 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 can't put up posters only within a set period, and that's either 30 days before the polling date, uh, and uh, they have to be taken down within seven days, I think, of the yeah, taken down within seven days of of the polling date. Sorry. Eight of May is eight of May is the start of the date in relation to the polling, and then on a polling day, uh, campaigning is forbidden, and posters must not must not be displayed within fifty meters of a polling station. That's important uh, too. Uh, so, as I, as I said, we have full guidance for candidates, and we'll be making it available in the very near future. We'll also be putting it on our website. Uh, this should be read carefully and received, and if there's any questions, contact us in corporate services in Kerry County Council or the returning officer. So look, thank you for your time and attention uh, there. I know it's, uh, it's, it's, some of it is heavy, but if you're running for election or you're involved in the process, it's, it's important that you're aware of uh, these guidelines, and uh, I hope it's of benefit to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Christian. Thanks, uh, Podrick, for that um, uh, very uh, detailed um, overview in relation to the operation of the council and the process um, around the um, elections. And um, look, as Christy said, it's a it's a challenging process at the best of times, um, but it's so important to follow the process because um, ultimately, if um, it isn't done correctly, then the penalties are significant. And could you imagine all that hard work and getting elected and then something being wrong at the other end? Not not, not what you want. Um, maybe at, at this stage, there might be some questions from the floor to uh, Christy and to, to Podrick. I think it's very important as well that, um, as Christy mentioned, um, all of this detail will be available shortly um, on the website and the message I'm very clearly picking up as well from uh, Christy is that if anyone has any questions or queries ask there's an open door in terms of engaging uh, with the corporate services uh, department in Kerry County Council and, and I'm sure Christy there's probably no question you haven't heard or whatever so I suppose the most important thing is that there's a an open door to anyone um, that has any questions or whatever do engage and it's important that you get the correct answers um, so I think we have some roving mics um, and uh, if we do have any questions whatever that are coming from the floor again maybe just to make sure whatever that you press the button on the speaker and um, just as we are streaming live that uh, people can hear, hear those questions so if we have any questions maybe the person just might identify themselves in terms of who they are and the question or whatever that they have so I'll open it to the floor I have someone down here to my left and I think someone Starts around. <laughs> um, <this> is, <laughs> so, so, sorry about that. I probably should let. Um, I suppose uh, I work with NEWKD, so I have a, a general question, uh, which I suppose is um, uh, court to all workers working with minority groups or protected groups um, with a view to you know having them fully included in society. So a more diverse council would be uh, that's more representative of the population would be um, you know. I think a, a, a good ambition. So, so my question is, congratulations on running an event like this. It's really good. Um, but yeah, so that, that's that's sort of my question. Okay, thank you, Christy. Will you take that? Yeah, um, thank you uh, for the question. I suppose uh, generally, Kerry County Council. Uh, the process is, it's an electoral process. It's, you know, it's open for anyone to run for election. 
and uh, as you mentioned, this is part of the process in, in, in working towards a diverse council. Uh, so the information uh, uh, that we're making available is really available to anybody, and we'll, we'll put it up on our website. Uh, look, does the government push to, to, I suppose, to increase the level of diversity generally, and we'll be working in line with that, with that uh, policy. Uh, we would hope to have other events in the future, and if there's any requests in relation to particular areas like that, we can take it on board. Uh, I suppose we're in a kind of a two-month run-up now to the local election, so uh, I know that many candidates uh, may have queries or whatever, and we can, we'll do our best to deal with that. Our response would be that, um, like I understand that the county council's role in relation to elections is, um, you know, it has to be kind of neutral and so on and so forth. Uh, but I suppose if there's anything that the council, like we're obviously happy to uh, promote active citizenship among minority groups and to, I suppose, to empower people to to think about running for, for office and to get involved in politics. So if there's anything the council thinks that, that we could do in collaboration, you know, we, we'd be quite um, we'd be quite willing to do it because obviously, you know, under public sector duty and so on, that there's a responsibility to to look at barriers to participation and so on and try to eliminate those. So you know, just to say that we'd, we'd be happy to, to 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 look at collaborating there if if that was required. Thanks very much. Okay, thank thank you for that. We'll uh, we'll take that on board and uh, we'll get some information out to you in relation to the general process. Also through the PPN, there's a there's a lot of work done in relation to uh, promoting, uh, you know, the, the role of local government and that, and we'll, we'll be working with the PPN on that. Perfect, thank you. And um, as part of the session later on, when we have our fireside chat conversation uh, with our elected councillors, I'm sure that there will be some matters that are arising or whatever that maybe might inform a discussion around different initiatives and interventions uh, that could be looked at in terms of, I suppose, ensuring that we have that uh, diverse uh, representation. Any other questions on the floor? We move on to the next part. Yep, just down here. If you. That's on. Okay. Um, Cleo Murphy from the Green Party uh, candidate for the Kinmare MD. So I have a few questions around donations. And, and one is that a colleague of mine, her father is a painter decorator. He's a man with a van and a, and a ladder. And he's going to put up all her posters. And she's worried, is that uh, an expense? Most, most people have volunteers to put them up, but because it's his trade, she's wondering about that. And my second question around um, donations, and I think I know the answer to this, but I, I, I just want affirmation on it. There's a, a, a limit of a thousand uh, euros as a, an individual donation to a candidate in a given year. If you end up having a local election and a general election in the same year, can you only get one thousand euro donation? Norm is laughing. Chris is scratching his head here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll um, I'll have a look there in the while the while the the meeting is ongoing in relation to the first query you had. In relation to the second, I would say it's one, but uh, I think it's one. You know, I, I, I uh, it says in a in a year, so I would think it's the one. But I can clarify that and come back to you as well. Sorry? Yeah. I think the question is, is it, is it a, a calendar year or is it within a 12 month period rolling uh, like? It's, it's the returns are done on a, on a calendar year basis. So, so I would expect it's so the calendar. It's on a different year, so oh, it, it, it would be okay. Yes, if it yeah. was a different year, yes, yeah, calendar wise. So January to the returns are done, you know, they have to be submitted, I think, by the end of January each year for the preceding year. So it's uh, it would be one thousand, I would think. I'm fairly certain of that, but I'll clarify it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to the next uh, part of the session this afternoon, and as I said again, we'll we'll have plenty of opportunity for for questions. So the next part of this afternoon's session, we're looking at the whole area of active uh, citizenship engagement and participation, and we're joined by Breed O'Sullivan and Emery Fuller, who are going to take uh, this part of the afternoon session. So I'm um, just going to welcome Breda up to the 
uh, podium here and um, Reid will be followed by Anne-Marie. Um, good afternoon and thank you, Breed, for the introduction. Um, as Breed said, my name is Breed O'Sullivan and I'm currently working in the public participation network section um, in the community department. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what the Kerry Public Participation Network is and the role of it. And then Anne-Marie will go through her role as a um, member of the Secretariat and also on the SBC and a rep on the LCDC. So... Um, what is the PPN? Um, the Public Participation Network um, is an independent representative body and they were set up as part of the Local Government Act 2014. So the PPN acts as the main official link between the community groups and the local authority. Um, PPNs, sorry, are, there's three different pillars within the PPN. You have social inclusion, community and voluntary, and the environmental. So social inclusion are organizations whose activities focus on social inclusion, social justice, and our equality. And examples of these include organizations which aim to support people with disability, refugees, asylum seekers, older people, women, young people, and those living in poverty. For the environmental section then, you have organizations whose primary activities are environmental protection, and our environmental sustainability. And then the third one is community and voluntary, and that's any organization whose primary activities are other than those li not listed above. So the purpose of the PPN, the primary purpose of the PPN is to enable the PPN member groups to input into and have their voices heard within the formal decision-making structures of the local authority. So I think like PPNs act as a mechanism to facilitate the two-way flow of information between the local authority and their groups to influence policy development and the delivery of services to the wider community. The democracy is strengthened by allowing diverse views and interests to be considered as part of the decision-making process of local government. And the result is then is more transparent, better informed and improved inclusive decisions. The work of Kerry PPN then, it's more four main aims in the PPN is participation in local policy, it's networking, capacity building and information. So your participation in local policy making, Kerry PPN representation on boards and committees. So they facilitate the participation and representation of communities in a fair, equitable and transparent manner through the environmental, social inclusion, community and voluntary sectors on decision making bodies. And like Podrick had said earlier, each um, of the SPCs within Kerry County Council, we have a Kerry PPN um, rep sitting on each of those SPCs and Anne-Marie, who will be sh talking shortly, is, sits on the environmental SPC. We also have Kerry um, PPN reps on the Kerry Age Friendly, which again is very important working with the local authority, the Joint Police Committee, and we also have a Kerry PPN rep sitting on each of the five municipal districts within Kerry County Council. Another aim of the Kerry PPN, and very important, is the networking. Um, we have plenary meetings, two big ones every year, and at these meetings it gets all the community registration groups to meet with each other and they outline then the work for the PPN for the following year. They also, Kerry PPN, would hold consultation workshops and policy development. We're also involved in the Kerry Community Awards, which is held every year. And then we also hold training and capacity building workshops. Again, this would be identified by um, asking our groups who are registered with the PPN what their main aims and what their needs were for training, and we would carry that out on behalf of them. And we also participate and engage in the national PPN conference on behalf of also our members. Another uh, role of the PPN is the capacity building. So to strengthen the capacity of communities and of the environmental, social inclusion community and voluntary groups to contribute pos positively to the community in which they reside. 
So for training workshops, cinema is based on members expressed and predicted needs. So for example, as I said, leadership programs, community planning, strategic planning, good governance, financial planning, fundraising strategy and grant information. All this training is always provided by the PPN um, free of cost when you are registered with the PPN as a community group within under one, each of the three different pillars. Um, another um, part of the PPN's work is providing information which is on our Facebook page, on our website which we are currently working on and launching a new website very shortly, kerryppn.ie. And we also distribute a weekly newsletter um, outlining again um, information on all the different community groups. Um, so to share the, with the wider Kerry PPN network. And you can sign up to the mailing email, email list by emailing ppn at kerrycoco.ie. So the Kerry PPN structure then how it all works. You have member groups per pillar and per municipal district. Currently in Kerry PPN, we have over 1,081 community groups registered with the PPN. And there is a need to re-register at least every five years to keep the network details up to date or shortly after your, your PPN contact person changes. So as I had mentioned earlier, the plenary. So the member groups are put the input into the work of the PPN. The plenary is the decision-making body of each PPN. It is made up of the representatives of all the registered groups of the PPN, and its role is to direct the operation of the PPN, setting overall PPN policy and processes. Membership meetings are a forum, forum for member groups to network and to hear about matters of interest to them. And also at the plenary, it decides priorities for the coming year. Your key, carry PPN structure. So at the main of the PPN, you have the secretariat, who are the administrative bodies of the PPN and carry out administrative duties on behalf of all the PPN members. Then you have the worker, which is myself and my colleague, Andrea, um, who again organise meetings um, for the secretariat and carry out all the duties as requested. Then you have community and voluntary, the environmental groups and social inclusion groups. And then out of that, you have the linkage groups as well, which we have recently um, launched the disability uh, linkage group and the environmental linkage group, which then feeds into the LCDCs, the SPCs, um, the local groups, boards, committees, again, feeding into council and working with the council. So as I had mentioned, you have the linkage group, the environmental linkage group, and Anne-Marie will be giving information on that shortly in regards to work that the environmental group have currently done in regards to the climate action plan. Um, and as I said, there's a newly formed disability linkage group as well. Registered member groups have an opportunity to make observations, raise questions, or put forward recommendations on behalf of their groups to the boards where PPNs are reps. They forward their query via email to ppn at kerrycoco.ie, outlining the name of your group and the municipal district your group is from. Your query will then be forwarded to the relevant rep who will raise the matter at the next scheduled meeting. Um, we also have a um, Kerry PPN rep on the Joint Policing Committee. Um, Podrick already mentioned that as well. And registered members have an opportunity again to make observations and raise questions on matters relating to crime, anti-social behaviour, with a view to improving the quality of life for all within the county. Again, send your inquiries to ppn at kerryco.ie, outlining the name of your group. So um, the secretariat, each Kerry county PPN has a secretariat, and we're looking in Kerry, we have currently 10 volunteer, voluntary members of the, on the Kerry PPN secretariat. Um, the secretariat, the main... Um, Functions of it is to facilitate the implementation of the decisions of the members, ensure the proper functioning of the PPN, coordinate activities of the PPN, and communicate regularly with all PPN members, and in this process, disseminate information concerning all PPN activities as widely as possible. Um, then I had said as well, the development officer and the support officer 
and they to we together organize meetings and events for members, secretariats and other stakeholders and promote the PPN and encourage membership. So lastly, I'd like just to finish on the benefits of membership. Um, access to information on decisions and proposals being made in their county and the ability to comment on and input into them along with other PPN member organisations. You have the opportunity to become part of a linkage group for a board or committee of interest and be able to have their views heard and contribute to local policy. Um, an opportunity to network with and learn from other organisations in the county who may be involved in similar types of projects. Access to relevant information on funding and grants coming through the local authority. The opportunity to advertise their activities via the PPN newsletter, website, emails and Facebook. And you have networking and sharing ideas. So again, if you have any queries or you know of any community groups that may not be registered currently with the PPN, just get in touch with us at PPN at kerrycoco.ie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brida. Anne-Marie is going to join us now, and then again after this uh, session we'll take some questions. Uh, thanks, Brida, for, for giving the introduction for the PPN there. And thanks, Breed. So my name is Anne-Marie Fuller. I sit on the Secretariat of the PPN, but also I'm the Environmental Rep. And as part of that role, how did I, I guess, become the environmental rep for the PPN? Well, I guess my journey started probably like many of yours at, in that I became activated as a community activist. My journey probably started in about 2018 or the end of 2018, 2019, when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, came out with a report that said essentially we have 10 years to have our, our emissions, our carbon emissions to be able to stave off the worst effects of climate change. And I had been working in this area for a number of years and I was involved in community groups. Um, I'm a member of the Kerry Sustainable Energy Cooperative. And through being a member of the Kerry Sustainable Energy Cooperative, which is a member of the PPN, I was then able to put myself forward for election to the environmental rep role. And those elections happened about five months after the local elections had happened. Um, so in that role, I, I was very pleased to be elected to it. Um, it's important for her to have an environmental rep role, I guess, I guess, because the environment wouldn't necessarily be a large focus um, or primary focus of many of the elected members of the council. Um, and that goes for the, uh, the importance of also having a social inclusion rep on the PPN, because that not, might not be a sole focus of many of the elected reps. So to have that uh, input and advocacy role um, into the council decision-making processes is very important. Uh, so as the environmental rep, then I was also put forward uh, to sit on the Strategic Policy Committee for Environment, Climate Action um, and Emergency Planning. Um, and so those, those meetings happen every few months. There's at least, I think, meant to be between four and six of those meetings a year. Um, they can shift around a bit, so you kind of need to be a bit flexible, but um, it's, it's really interesting to sit on them because if you're interested in local politics and you're interested in getting involved in your local community and making those helping and um, be an advocate for the decision making and um, bringing the voice of the community onto those um, boards, um, it's, it's an effective role if you're not an elected rep. I should point out that uh, it's not my place to bring my own personal decisions and opinions um, to, that, to, that, to those meetings. Um, whatever I bring has to have come from the community. So through that, I would be then linking in with, they're called the environmental linkage group, and any issues that would have been discussed in environmental linkage group meetings, then I would bring forth to the Strategic Policy Committee. Um, but also any of the members, uh, the member groups are allowed bring, send emails into the PPN at kerrycoco.ie email address. And I would also then bring those to the Strategic Policy Committees um, that I sit on. Um, the process I would like to say is actually, um, it's been quite fruitful. Uh, one of the things that I would have brought forward from, from the groups is that for 
maybe when I joined and even up to two years afterwards, we didn't have uh, an environmental awareness officer. Now, I'm sure that would have been brought forward by a lot of other different reps um, and councillors at the time. But in my capacity uh, speaking for, uh, for the PPN in those meetings, I was able to raise that issue. Um, and then we're very grateful that we have now, for the last two or three years, an environmental awareness officer. But through that, we were also able to raise the issue that um, one of the council workers was doing their biodiversity um, officer role as a part-time basis. Um, and we were able to stress that no, we would love to have a biodiversity officer as a full-time position. And now in the last year, we have had, we have a biodiversity officer. And we also now have a climate action team and we have a climate action officer. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, as part of it would, would have been consultations around um, the climate conversations that came in, that the government brought in. This was a national program, Kerry County Council, or sorry, Kerry PPN rather, with Kerry County Council, because we collaborate closely with them, uh, was chosen as a pilot county to run that. And so we organised, uh, and this happened through COVID, so we had um, hot online meetings uh, via Zoom to meet lots of different uh, member groups who were part of the environmental groups and get their opinions on what do, what kind of what are the actions we need to take at community level for climate action and biodiversity action uh, one of just one of the examples of that was that we said we need to have a county level climate action plan and and here we are now and it's just um been adopted this this year earlier this year uh, the Kerry County Council climate action plan so also through the last previous year through the environmental linkage group and we also spread it out to um all the member PPN member groups, you don't just have to be an environmental linkage group because the environment, um, you know, it interacts with us all, or we all interact with the environment, it, it, it affects us all. So we, um, we would have had an initial consultation on that where we would have put forward lots of ideas. We would have had, we organised a big meeting uh, and then we got a lot of input then from the community groups to come in and say what did they think needed to be in the Kerry County Council, Kerry, Kerry Climate Action Plan. Um, we submitted that, you know, a number of page document that got submitted um, and then the Climate Action Team would have taken that information um, and combined it with other information they had from different, um, from the councillors or also from different areas like the CARO, which would be the, the Climate Regional Office. So um, Climate Action Regional Office. So, um, and this would also be, and they would have got information from national government as well and things like that. Um, so then there was a draft proposal then put out for consultation. And again, we as the PPN would have organized a consultation um, meetings where member groups could come in and talk to us about, you know, what were the details of that climate action plan that needed to be um, addressed or what did we like more? What did we not like? Uh, it came out very strongly that a lot of the actions, it was great to have lots of actions in it because we'd already submitted them previously. Uh, but maybe the governance area of it and how, how were they going to actually manage to make sure that these actions were um, essentially administered and um, actioned, essentially. Uh, so uh, it was lovely to see then in the, final in the final version of the Climate Action Plan that there was an added section um, diagram about the governance of it and how all those actions were going to be actioned and who was going to be responsible for what. So you can see that even though um, we're not elected, we still, through the PPN, we can still have influence um, and bring the voice of the community in, into the council and their decision-making processes and their documentation. Um, so I also sit on, <laughs> are we okay for time? <laughs> yep, uh, so um, as a secretariat member, I also get to then, um, I've been selected for maybe the last year to sit on the local community development committee. Um, and that's a really interesting committee as well, because, and actually there's two parts to it. One is the local action group as well, um, and one is the LCDC. And there's d decisions there are made about uh, which community groups uh, get funding for leader funding. And there's different, um, uh, I guess, processes that would come from through the local development committees um, about how SICAP funding gets done and, and things like that. So. And even today, we talked about, um, we got a report from Healthy Kerry. So there's, if you're interested, it's it's a great way through the PPN 
uh, to find out a lot more about the processes of what happens um, in the local in the local council because there's actually so much work going on um, in the background. Just I, I guess the count. <laughs> The council workers, actually, they're probably like ducks, you know, they look like that, but their legs are going like this under, <laughs> under the water. You know, there's just so much activity going on. And um, I would say, actually, they don't get enough um, acknowledgement for all the great work that they're doing. Um, it's it's great that actually as a as a PPN uh, representative, we get, we get to, we have a very uh, good working relationship with the people in the council because um, we're not looking for votes. <laughs> so, you know, we don't have to be saying things in the papers to, you know, to try and get things done. And, and what I would say is it's so important. Um, and you understand this, and it's probably taken me a while to understand it even more fully, but it's the relationships that you build um, with the people who you work with in the council that, you know, helps you really uh, get things done as well. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in working uh, in local government is to really work on those relationships that you have um, with the people in the council, but also your fellow councillors, because um, I'm probably veering off now a little bit. But, you know, if you're going to get motions adopted in the council and you want things done, you know, you need other parties to vote with you as well. So I'd say relationship development is very important. Um, and if I can just finish on. Um, so the PPN, we're, we're part of, I guess, the toolkit or uh, the cogs and the, the bolts of, of local government. Um, if, if, and I really hope all the people who are putting themselves forward here today for election in the local elections get elected. Um, because the PPN, we would love to work with you. Um, I guess previously maybe there was seen as a competition between the PPN and elected councillors. But really, I think we can work really well together um, to even help, you know, the... Uh, other elected officials, but also um, the people who work in the council to get things done, because really we all together have the same objectives. You know, we really want Kerry um, and our local communities to be, you know, the best places to live um, and work and play. Thanks, Anne-Marie. And um, I suppose, Emery, you, you give thanks or whatever there, whatever to the council executive and council officials and, and uh, politicians and so on, whatever the elected representatives. But I suppose it's a it's an ideal opportunity at a forum like this or whatever to recognise the work of the likes of yourself as a volunteer and all the people that are involved in the PPN. Um, it's it, People are so gracious and giving of their time um, and I suppose dealing with and addressing the issues that are important to all of us in County Kerry. So just, I think it's really the appropriate that we express our thanks to all of those that are involved in volunteerism throughout the county because you know sometimes um, it, it's important that we recognize year work year effort year influence and even some of the examples that you demonstrated there Henry on behalf of all of us on behalf of all of the volunteers that are involved in different organizations throughout the county thank you from each and every one of us so just um, if there are any questions that we have uh, for Breda and Marie from the, from the floor, could we take them now? I have one question, maybe, Marie, if you if you if you didn't mind or whatever. You know, when you were um, chatting there, you were talking just about the act, you know, the influence that you have on you know as a volunteer as a committee member and and you know um you demonstrated there a number of examples in relation to kind of impact you had in plans and roles and you know kind of even increasing a role from a half-time post to a full-time post you know uh, driving forward development of a plan and so on um in your opinion is there more we can do i suppose to inform people regarding the opportunities they can make in, in terms of impacting where we work, where we live, on a volunteer basis. Uh, yeah, well, I think actually, um, you know, events like today, um, you know, where we can, you know, invite the general public out, um, you know, and advertise it well. And, you know, like today's was, in, you know, in the papers and on the, you know, in Radio Kerry and, the low, you know, on social media and that. Um, I think we just, essentially, it's more events like these more regular you know talking to people um because it does i'll be honest now it took me a little while to get my head around the public participation network and all the different 
uh, parts of it. You know, I didn't mention it, but there's a handbook and it's like, you know, it's like this big. Yes. You know, for, for different rules and procedures. And, yeah. uh, you know, well, it includes templates and suggestions as well. But, um, you know, I think... I mean, if I'd love it in a way, if you know, if we even got into primary schools and secondary schools, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and just you know, civics classes, and just to explain to people what you know what goes on in local government, um, because I was very lucky. I should probably add is that um, Social Justice Ireland uh, did a training course um, through. Well, it was Waterford IT at the time. It's it's no, it's now part of the university structure, but. Um, where you know all the different PPN reps from all over Ireland were able to attend an online training um, about the council and the different things like that. So, yeah, I would just say it's it's more events and more kind of education, general education, um, yeah. and maybe I don't know if there's if there's profiles could be put up um, in the local paper maybe mm -hmm. as a, as an ongoing thing. You know, what did what did what's someone's job and um, what what's involved in their job in the council or. Yeah. Day in the life of a councillor, you know, <laughs> the two sides. Yeah, anyway. absolutely. Yeah. And I definitely think there's a takeaway from this session or whatever, uh, maybe in some actions around that um, uh, as well. Um, Christy had a question and he went off to do some research or whatever and is in a position to answer that question. So I'm going to hand over to Christy next. I think it was from yourself. Uh, yeah. Uh, I suppose in the guidelines that we'll be we'll be start making available but uh, one of them uh, section 1.7 is what expenditure is excluded from the definition of, ex of election expenses and uh, one of those items that's excluded is benefits derived from a service rendered by an individual including the use of an individual's motor vehicle on behalf of a candidate at a local election where the service provided is gratuitous and is not part of the individual's work carried out under a contract of employment or where the individual is self-employed in the course of a person's business or in the practice of a person's profession so if it's not being done on a contract if it's being done you know uh, it's it's a, a guideline document that will be circulating to all candidates and it's uh, section 1.7 in it so it it basically sets out that if it's if it's not under a contract if it's doing done on a gratuitous basis then it wouldn't be uh, and it wouldn't count as an election expense so after the relevant date get them going and hang up those posters <laughs> Okay, we're going to take um, a five minute break, I think, whatever, um, uh, from the back of the room I've been uh, suggested, whatever, that we take a tea coffee break just for five minutes. And then if it's okay, we're going to get move forward with the next part of the afternoon session, which is our uh, chat with a number of the councillors that we have uh, here present this afternoon. So if we can take a five minute break. Okay, we okay? Yeah, okay. So um, look, this is the final part of this afternoon session. And... Um, I'm delighted that we're joined by a number of our female um, elected uh, councillors. Um, and uh, we're joined to, to my left um, here by Councillor Deirdre Ferris and also joined by Councillor Marie Maloney. And here to my right, joined by Councillor Norman Moriarty and Councillor um, Aoife Thornton. So really, the, this part of uh, this afternoon's session, we're just going to have a conversation, okay? I have some questions that I'm going to chat to the councillors um, that I have to ask or whatever. And then also, before uh, this afternoon's session, we invited um, members of the public to submit or whatever some questions. So we're going to go through those. And um, also, again, from the floor, if we do have some questions, whatever, we're going to take the opportunity to go through those or whatever as well. All right. So, um, so look, the first question that I'm going to kick off with or whatever, and um, I might uh, put this question maybe to um, Aoife, maybe as a starting point or whatever. And I suppose, Aoife, the question I'm going to ask you, whatever, is that, you know, as a public representative, um, the challenges around balancing everything from a responsibilities perspective, you know, um, being in public office with, you know, work, family commitments or whatever, so on, can be a challenge. Um, so I suppose, how do you balance those responsibilities? Okay. Um, so it's lovely to be here and really nice to meet you and um, to, to all the candidates, the very best of luck and keep the head down for the next couple of weeks, you'll get there. Um, you probably feel at the moment like it's never going to end, but it does. Um, and uh, look, on the life balance, I've um, three children and uh, they were pretty much all born. 
um, during the last 10 years of my council term. And um, like anybody with children or other family commitments um, or caring for another um, family member or whatever, there's always going to be a bit of a juggle and the juggle changes over the years. And I'm no different to anybody else like Norma or anyone else who's trying to juggle you know, that family life, but um, but you have to do it. And I suppose the, for me, what I found the hardest was the uncertainty and um, of every day being different and um, the hours every day being different. Um, but I, I wouldn't discourage anybody to get into politics. It's just for my particular for, um, family circumstances, um, you know, 10 years of that, I, I just had to leave it at that. I have a child with special needs that needs kind of um, just structure. Um, but, you know, with the family balance, it's possible. It's so doable. It, the variety is incredible. Um, uh, it's such a satisfying job. And so like in any other job, that um, sense of variety and fun and hard work and job satisfaction and fulfillment um, will help you you know find a balance and um and get through it so like you do need to find a time to go for a walk fresh air and all the usual when you're working um and you need to set down i suppose um that structure for yourself because uh like for me and for, you know you know i have a family that depend on me so i need to make sure that um i'm getting some bit of time in the day for myself so that i can keep all the other show on the road um but uh i suppose like the weekends, the night time, the early mornings, you know, you do get calls at all times of the day, but there are pockets then of free time. So don't be afraid of it. That does come as well. Um, so I suppose what I would say is, you know, try, try your best canvas, try and get in. If you get in, uh, take it like any other job, work hard, find a bit of time for yourself in it all, enjoy it. Um, in that hard work, you'll find great fulfillment and find the things that you're interested in um, and, and you know, try and make a difference in those areas. And then the job is very satisfying. So I don't know if that answers it. Yeah, perfect, um, Aoife. Thank you. Um, Deirdre, what would you answer to that question? Well, I disrupted the whole meeting a little while ago to run out to organise pickups for my two teenagers. <laughs> Um, no, look, I suppose my biggest problem is I don't shut off and I would always, um, and it was one of the first things that was said to me by my sister and, uh, she said, dear, I get a second phone and shut, have it, have your own time, have your own time. Um, I got the second phone and after a year of not using it, I canceled the contract. It was point, you know, it's, it is what it is. I do. I have. My free time is my free time, and I'd often share book recommendations with Norma at the end because we're both readers, and that's my that's my time. Um, I can shut everything off when I read it. But as as Eva has rightly pointed out, there is some great job satisfaction in what we do. We predominantly outside of the meetings and outside of policy decisions, we deal. We advocate. We advocate on behalf of people, human beings who are having difficulties or issues within their lives. And when you can get something across the line, it, the satisfaction and, and the fulfillment, as Eva rightly said, is something that stays with you. I did actually dance around my kitchen one day when a person I'd been advocating hard for after 12 years in the house and to get the empty house that was down the road from her. And I danced around the kitchen. That's how fulfilling it felt. and. It's it's almost emo it's very emotive this job. It's you you feel you're you're dealing with people and sometimes in the mo they're the, at their most vulnerable, they're at their most distressed. Um, but being able to do anything at all in the roles that we have, and I suppose with the connections and the context that we are able to develop over time, um, it is probably the greatest part of this job. Um, I would never deter anybody from going into it. <coughs> But I would highly advise to listen to the advice of my sister and get a second phone and have your own time <laughs> then learn to shut off. Perfect. Thank you. Marie, if I was to ask you, what do you enjoy most about being a counsellor? There's a lot of things to enjoy. There is a lot of things that are hard. There's no doubt about it. There's a lot of things that are a challenge. But uh, for me, uh, the sense 
of helping someone. The sense of, uh, you know, it, it may only be helping someone get a medical care. My area of expertise is actually outside of the remit of a council, really, which is social welfare. And I do a lot of work on social welfare. I do um, oral hearings of people. I do their appeals. I help them. You know, sometimes people, if they literally tick a box on a farm, it can make a difference, simple thing. But I sit with them, I go through them, I help them fill up the farms. But this sense of satisfaction that we get from the job, not just what the people get, but what we get, it's, it's, it's amazing. I have um, experienced politics from a few different perspectives because number one, I started off as a, a, a secretary to a TD, which I've been for, doing for 15 years. And I used to be able to go home at night and, as I said before, bar uh, or not meeting, and I'd be there with, while the kids were young. And then as it rolled on and moved on, um, I, became, I got elected to Kerry County Council first, and then I, I ran the general election, uh, and I missed out on that one, and I then subsequently uh, contested the Senate election. I wasn't appointed. I, I got elected to the Senate and I spent five years in Dublin, and uh, then I came back, and for personal reasons, I certainly didn't want to be in Dublin anymore, and um, I got re-elected to Kerry County Council, so I had to go out twice and win back the council seat on behalf of the Labour Party, and I did it, and the satisfaction in doing that is great, but there are challenges, and there's no doubt about it. It, it does interfere with family life, and there's no point in saying there isn't. It doesn't. As I was being interviewed on Radio Kennedy a few minutes ago, I told them that when I was in Dublin, my, my first grandchild was born, and uh, I was missing out on that. I was missing out on her life, and my husband used to mind her one day a week. And when I come home from Dublin, she hardly knew me. She hardly knew me, uh, because even though you come down to Thursday night, Friday it might be the Dingle Peninsula, or it might be the Verat Peninsula. You were out doing clinics for the whole day out around meetings at night time and things. So it does interfere. So you do need back up in the home, very much so. I have, thankfully, I can say I have a fantastic husband who is my rock. And I can tell you, when I was in Dublin, there might have been no clean clothes to wear if it wasn't for him. He was great. <laughs> but it's but it's all the little practical things, you know? Yeah. Uh, like, I know that some of the men, when they were, they were telling us, they'd come in and the clothes would be washed for them. And then when they're going up to Dublin, the suitcase was packed for them again, going off. And they can literally, and this is one thing I find the difference between male and female in these roles is, a man can wear a suit, and he can wear it 52 weeks of the year and nobody blinks an eye at it like, but we have to have different jackets and different things because people say, does she have anything else to wear? <laughs> and it, that's, that is the reality of it, like. So there are all those little things that, that kind of you have to put a lot of time into, do you know? Yeah. So, but as I say, the satisfaction in the job, and I would encourage all of them here and the, and the candidates that are here today, and I'd say to you, keep at it, keep there, you'll get there eventually. And uh, it is, and when you do get elected, when you do get elected, you are treated exactly the same as any male man or any male person in the room in the council, they, they, they treat you all the same. You get the same services, you get the same uh, attention from all the staff in Kerry County Council. So there is no difference when you're in there. It's getting in there that is the, the difficult thing. But look, I just say to you, keep at it, ladies, uh, and I wish you all the very best of luck in the forthcoming elections. Marie, that's great words of encouragement. And um, I suppose, you know, it, it, even so far, whatever in the conversation, I suppose, kind of having that commitment and that determination and wanting to succeed and wanting to achieve, obviously are very, you know, key motivators in terms of actually, you know, looking for success in politics. And and it doesn't always happen the first time and maybe it doesn't happen the second time and maybe it might happen in one political arena but not in another arena. So I suppose, um, Norma, it comes in or whatever to maybe some advice that you might give to people that are, you know, considering um, considering going down the political path. Um, and, and I suppose from sharing from your experience, if you were to say to people here today, look, this is the advice that I would give you. 
That's a very big question. Mm -hmm. um, the advice that I give you, get comfortable shoes, definitely, anyway, number one. Uh, and, and I constantly have arguments with my sisters when they see me going out the door. You've much nicer boots than that. And I said, I'm not standing in 10 hours in those. Uh, so you, you do have to do those pragmatic things. Look, I, I, I love the job. I have to say, I still love the job. Um, and you ask what are the great things about it. It's the people that you meet in every walk of life, and they come into you. And you're not going to be able to help them in every single query. But if you give them your best for every single query, that's that's all you can do, and they will genuinely appreciate that. And there are certain things that aren't achievable, but make an effort to get to the point where you discover, okay, that actually isn't achievable. You know, don't dismiss something. Uh, talk to people, listen to them, uh, because they have come to you to, to do that. Like our clinics, you know, I often wonder from going up, you know, why do they call them clinics? And in a way, it's, uh, and, and, you know, even as a counsellor, and I would, people do actually see you in a, as a counsellor in all of its meanings. You know, they, they will confide things in you that they, they, they're not going to confide in other people. Um, and, you know, be very respectful of that. There's a confidentiality around that. There's um, an attention around that. There, that That's a privilege that somebody trusts you to do that. So just be, be aware of that as well. Um, and honestly, do your best for those people. I, I, it is, like, I, I, most of my work life, I was um, a teacher. I'm now actually finding myself uh, doing reps for my past pupils. Uh, uh, I know I'm feeling a little bit older because they now have children, and uh, uh, but it's it, yeah. And you know, again, they've I've seen I've actually seen these people from childhood now up into adulthood, and 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 you're trying to help them. And again, that's a privilege. That's a genuine privilege. Um, and they remind me of the things that I did in the classroom too. By the way, uh, they they don't forget you. Um, it, it, we live in, in a stunning county, and again, that's another thing I'll say. While you're going around canvassing, take a few minutes to actually enjoy where you're canvassing as well. Um, you know, I, I, I'll be back in Bola's Head in two days' time. It's And some of you will see it, some of you won't. It's incredible. You know, I'll be on Valencia Island. I'll be places now like, you know, Lahern and Letter and Townlands, Kimego, beautiful Townlands, the names of them even. Like, take the time to enjoy where you're going as well. You're going to meet people in incredible places. You'll actually get to know your county better than you ever would have done before. Um, and take that in and, and, and treasure it. And listen to the people on the door. You'll also encounter people who might not have spoken to somebody in the last two or three days. And actually, they will welcome you in and they will want to talk to you and try and spare them that extra few minutes to have that conversation with them, okay? And they, they will reward you, I, I guarantee you. If they won't give you the number one, they certainly will acknowledge you. Uh, but, but And even sometimes, you know, you'll meet people who are in bad form, or they've had a very, you know, because we are meeting farmers who are actually struggling at the moment with very difficult weather conditions, with a lot of stress, an awful lot of stress. And they will need to vent, okay? They're venting. They're not giving out to you. They're venting about the stresses and the difficulties. So be aware of that. You can separate that from the angst that they might feel and, and be able to talk to them about it. And if there is something you can do to help or point them in a direction, of course you will try and do that. But it's it's an extraordinary job um, and, and it is a privilege to have it. So uh, I, I, wish, I genuinely wish you all the best of luck. And I do think um, the, the women approach it probably slightly different to men. Uh, and it is, as Marie says, once you get there, you're the same as everybody else. But I think there may be, and again, you know, maybe I'm profiling here, but there, there's a sense of maybe some of those softer skills that are really important uh, in, in dealing with people and in helping them. And never be afraid to, to, to use those as much as possible as well. Thank you. Thanks, Norma. And I think, um, you know, the words you use there, trust and privilege, you know, it, it is... Um, it is a privilege to be in that position where someone trusts you enough to come and to talk to you, sometimes about very sensitive and personal matters or whatever, and I suppose it is um, it is a privilege to be able to then help people navigate them through whatever difficulties or whatever they might have. You, you just touched on there, Norma, just maybe about um, maybe characteristics or attributes, perhaps, wherever that females have um, that maybe, you know, better lend themselves to looking at um, maybe certain aspects of a role in politics or whatever. And, Deirdre, I was just going to ask you, you know, from your perspective, whatever, do you think there are any sort of unique perspectives or contributions, perhaps, that women bring to politics? Um, it's actually, as Norma was talking and... Uh, it, it hit me I, as if the only female representative in the Tralee LEA. Um, women very, very, in very vulnerable situations, women um, who may fear being alone with a man as a result of domestic violence, I think that level of trust in them to be able 
to feel comfortable enough or in some way safe enough to come to me because they can't go to a man. I think that that in itself is probably one of the most important facets of having female representation because you are dealing with people who have an innate fear of a man because of a past trauma, because of existing um, domestic violence within the home, and they need somebody they can trust and somebody they do not fear. Uh, and that it's sometimes it's only a starting point. They're just trying to figure out something. How do what do I do? What 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 can I get? Can I can I get a home because I have tied up in a family home that's in ownership or loads of different things. But the fact that they've started, they've taken that courageous step to go and reach out. But the fact that there's somebody there is by far the most important thing. Somebody they feel safe enough to go to. So for me, Bree, that's probably one of the most important elements from our perspective here as local representatives. That's probably the start. In a lot of cases, then you would deal with. And, and I think it's important to note that you still have that, I suppose, male um, fear of the men, the, the males feeling vulnerable amongst their own gender. And you might find um, that men would be more open to speaking to women about difficulties that is that is upsetting them because they feel they can't. So I think that there's that element. They see women as an easier person to discuss their private business with uh, and to get emotional about it. You know, and, and I think that's something that, and, and Norma said the word privilege, it is probably the greatest privilege that somebody trusts you at the most difficult time in their lives. And Marie, you're nodding in agreement. Absolutely. I, when I was in the Senate, I did um, a lot of work. Actually, I was, you know, I was told I was the first person to bring to the house, to the floor of the board or office houses, uh, the issue of domestic violence. I did a lot of research. I did a lot of even here in Tralee and and uh, nationally before I moved my um, private member's motion on it. Uh, you learn an awful lot, I can tell you, by talking to women and by listening to their stories. And you have to build up the trust. The, 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 the people that come to you with those issues, need to know that you are confidential mm -hmm. and that you will keep whatever stories you hear to yourself. And I think that that is very important in politics is the trust that you build, that people, you know, you build for people and that the confidentiality and you don't talk about it. And like I would often say, if a, if a, if a woman came in to me or a man, and I went outside on the street and I met that husband or wife of, the, of that person. I wouldn't even say, well, Joni was into me this morning or I met Mike today or whatever. If they said to me, oh, well, Joni was into you today, I'd say, yeah, they were. But I would never tell, not even the closest relative of a person who came into my office. Absolutely not. I think you need to build up that confidence. And just even, as you say, bringing a different perspective to the table, I'll take just one small example, right? At Christmas time, we do a bit of free parking for, for uh, um, Christmas shopping and things. And usually, and, and like in Killarney now, and I know these lads over here, they are looking at me, but everyone says <laughs> they can close their ears. They seem to tend to give the car parks farthest away from the shops to the freebies. And like uh, people, some, uh, and uh, as they debated it once, a uh, certain male politician says, well, should this walk do go to come down? I said, <laughs> but I said, look at it from this perspective. A mother with a buggy or a child, a toddler by the hand uh, and a child in a buggy and her bags of shopping. That's not practical. That's not practical to them to get to walk to the faraway car park. Simple things. The men don't seem to think of those things. Whereas a woman, we do. We think of that. I also try to uh, encourage um, family spaces, you know, for, for um, parents and children in the car parks. But the, the um, public car parks, believe it or not, there's no, um, there's no jurisdiction over it. They can't put him in because you can't, uh, you can't police him in, in in the public car parks. But the the trouble of getting a buggy out of a car and, and getting a child out of a car seat and putting the buggy in these tight little spaces, it's crazy. But if me male, and I'm sorry, no guys, the guys in the room just don't seem to see that. Yeah. 
Whereas as women, we we know what it's like. We've encountered it, and we've seen we see the the problems with things. But simple things like that, you can bring a female perspective into. That's only just a small thing, but there are a lot of other issues too. And, and I suppose it leads on to the whole area of diversity, you know, because when we have different, uh, you know, representatives from our community, you know, sitting around the uh, council representing, you know, different um, different cohorts of our community, you know, we get that different perspective, don't we, in terms of what are the different challenges, be it male or female, uh, be it someone or whatever who's only just come to, just come to the country, someone who's Irish, it, it, lots of different perspectives it can be presented. So I suppose, um, Aoife, it just leads kind of to my next question around, I suppose, you know, the more diverse our council is, the more, um, I suppose, views we can hear, the more opinions we can hear, I suppose, you know, the the better we'd say the different communities are representatives in terms of our, you know, their concerns, their views and so on. I suppose, would you have any views or insights as to, I suppose, how we can work towards making our council truly diverse to represent now what we have in terms of a, a very diverse community in our county? Um, can I just pick up one point there because I just really would like to get it across you know that whole trust and meeting people and everything when you're going out canvassing and you're meeting people I just feel like after 10 years in the council I would like to see this be safe yourselves as well do you know when you're going out meeting people I'm sure you all agree into people's homes into people's do you know just be careful yourselves as well because as women you can be vulnerable and, um, you know, I'm sure all of us have different stories and, and situations that we could, um, you know, tell you about where we've put ourselves in situations we probably shouldn't have. Like, for example, we don't have an office in Listowel. And so, you know, I would have gone out and met people. Now I've kind of changed the way I do that and I meet them in public places. And that's so I just want to say that to you as you're out and about and just be safe about it. Um, diversity, for sure. Um, it's critical. Um, we, we need to be more diverse. Like if you look at, you know, we need young, we need old, we need different minority groups, we need um, men, we need women, you know, and, and the more diverse for sure and certain, the better it is, the more input you have into policies from different perspectives, different life experiences, um, yeah, different viewpoints. I mean, look, we, you know, we've, we've a good, you know, there's good debate in the council different parties, independents, non-parties. Um, like what I would say probably about that is the most obviously, and we know it anyway, but the most important part of all of it, and we were just discussing it outside the door, is respectful debate. You, you have as much diversity as you can with as many different viewpoints as you can have. And then with that, you have respectful debate. And I think out of that, you're going to have your best result mm -hmm. um, where you can have a mix of all of that. So. How do you encourage more of that? Um, I do think, you know, what, what you, I don't think, I, I would say 90% of people haven't a clue what we're doing every day. And, and that probably means that, you know, we're losing a lot of people that may get involved otherwise, be it from minority groups or whatever. So I do think there is a piece of work that could be done. I'd be happy to actually be involved in that, even outside of politics, um, to encourage more people to get in. And I do think, you know, whether it's in the paper, on the radio or whatever, what are you actually doing all day? Like this morning, I was chairing the LCDC and the LAG and Marie's on it, you know, about leader funding and the different fundings in the county and arising out of that. Then you're on different other subgroups. And, and then I'm here today. I would say the general public have no clue. They just think I'm there for potholes and whatever else. <laughs> They've no idea, 90% of people, I would say. So there's, there is definitely a piece of work there in explaining the role while not canvassing. Yeah. Do you know that you're just doing it to just communicate with people what it is and maybe stem a bit of interest from that yeah. to all the different groups then, you know, as well. Excellent, very good. And again, I think a, a takeaway from this is it's that whole communication piece around the different activities, the council, the committees, the councillors, um, and um, and even that whole sort of profiling of people for role models or whatever for, for the future, because we need people to be interested in politics and to get involved in politics. And, um, you know, I think it'd be probably even an interesting piece of work or whatever if we went in and we spoke to a group of students in transition year, you know, how many put their hands up and say, yeah, I see myself in Vietnam politics or whatever into the future. Um, I'm not too sure there'd be too many hands or whatever that would be going up, you know. Yeah. So, um, Norma, if you were back day one and you were considering uh, um, entering into politics, 
what advice would you like that someone would have given you? Um, I suppose looking back in it, uh, I, I, I've often spoken to people about when I got the phone call um, to consider uh, because a, a vacancy arose, you know, before the 2014 uh, uh, council elections and it was January and I got a phone call and I was standing at my desk at the 11 o'clock break. The students were streaming out uh, making plenty of noise and I took the call and um, I can't repeat the first two words that came out of my mouth uh, but it was in the negative not a hope uh, and then subsequently people said you know consider it the, the wisest thing I was told was just take 24 hours to consider it and discuss it with the people around you and um, I was doing the work anyway to a large degree and I would imagine everybody here is involved in their residence association their GA clubs their tidy towns groups and um, the people who show up to get things done okay and you are therefore a natural leader because you're a leader in your own communities and to encourage those people to get involved as much as possible to go back to the day one of being a councillor i'd actually have loved the session that we had this morning because i genuinely hadn't a clue about putting down motions or questions and your by the way your party colleagues won't tell you anything about that because yeah. <laughs> once you get elected they become one of your main competitors um so i spent a good number of months learning that quite frankly i had to learn that uh, so that was a very, very good session this morning. That was that was very helpful, uh, and it just about because it you know again like you come from it with your perspective of having been like I was involved in IRD Water with the local community development group. I did have the patience about how slow things are. Um, Deirdre has referenced before about one of the things he finds frustrating is how slowly things move, and they do move slowly. If you want to get something changed or done, it does take time. And um, you'd tell people that uh, a road quite obviously needs to be done. We'll get it in the next three-year roads program and if you're in year two of that that's frustrating okay because there's a process and a length of time that has to go but as somebody who had come from the community development side of it with our local community development group i was actually used to that i knew things took time okay so I, i'd have patience around that you have to get the processes correct you have to make sure that your applications line up with the local development plans whether it's local either the lecp or or the the local area plans these are the nuts and bolts and this is where be, being a bit of a policy nerd helps, okay? Because you'll be able to help the groups, the applicant bodies, to put the application together in a way that's successful. Um, and 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 I know people, and there'll be a lot of people that we'll be campaigning with now who'll say, ah, oh, it's too slow, and they'll get frustrated. And if I get in there, I'll shout loud enough, and I'll get it done quickly. You won't, okay? The pro yeah, the, you just go horse. The process takes what it takes, and it's it is actually about sticking to it and being patient and building up those relationships. Uh, and quite frankly, there isn't anything sexy about it. It's just hard work. <laughs> that's that's basically it. That, the, honest to God, that's it. But beware of those who will tell you they'll get it done in a flash, because that's nonsense. They won't. Keep and selling it there, Norma. Yeah. Keep <laughs> selling it. It's a very sexy job, folks, OK? <laughs> Um, thanks, thanks, Norma. And and you know what? I suppose day one, if you got that advice, maybe in terms of expectations people have, you know, when maybe they get elected or whatever, and they think I'm going to go in here and I'm going to change the world, you know. And it's just, I suppose, to be realistic yourself, because maybe you might end up getting frustrated yourself if you say, "Gosh, I didn't make the progress I thought I was going to make," whatever. So I suppose it is about being realistic in terms of what one can achieve. Um, and uh, I think that that would that's definitely take away from it. Um, maybe if we might open it to the floor, are there any questions or whatever that uh, people would like to ask or whatever from from the floor? Just the if you can take the mic there, yeah. And hello, uh, my name is Caroline Kennelly, and I'm a candidate in the Killarney LEA. Firstly, I want to say that I admire all women on the panel, amazing women, and. Uh, I'd love to join Marie in the Killarney LEA, another woman for Killarney. Um, but how do I put across uh, going forward uh, my softer skills? You know, like um, there's very important uh, aspects to it, housing, infrastructure, the potholes, which people always remember you got filled or whatever. But how do you put across those softer skills? Like how can I uh, put across to people that I also would help with farms and I'd also listen and I'd also direct you in the areas that need to done because when you are on Radio Kerry or you're on press or whatever, you are kind of on about the housing or you're on roads and stuff like that. So have you any advice around that, please, for someone who's brand new uh, doing this? I work in um, 
Pat Daly's office as well. So I've loads of those skills, but no one would really know that in Killarney as such, because I'm here in Tralee. And I love the job as well. And um, thanks for answering the first question. That was actually my own question. So Aoife and everyone answered it brilliant. Thank you. Um, perfect. I'm going to hand over to Marie for... No, it's okay. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, Caroline, thank you for the question. Caroline, you're in a very similar situation to what I was. You are a secretary to a TD. That's where I learned my skills, like you are learning them now. And I guess because you're in Tralee, maybe that the people in Killarney don't know you as well, whereas I was in the Killarney electoral area and, uh, and they knew me. But it was through that work, I think, that, that I developed those skills and that the people knew I had those skills because they were coming into the office. And like the TD, like you know, is not there uh, three or four days a week or they're out on the TD. You're actually doing a lot of the work. And you and I think the people know that. Like, So I, I also would say to you, get involved in the community. I do so much voluntary work that if, if I don't get elected to Kerry County Council on this occasion, I will still have plenty of work to do. I am involved in so much, particularly in healthcare uh, and people with disabilities. I work an awful lot with it. And I think when you are working with disabilities and people who are vulnerable, you your soft side, as you call it, does come true because you have to be that way. You have to have empathy with the people. You have to uh, show them that you really do care and that you don't mind. I mean, at the moment, I'm working with um, uh, Killarney in um, with trying to make Killarney an artistic friendly uh, town. And I'm working with a great group of people there and a great committee, and we're doing a lot of work there. I'm chairperson of Kerry Respite Care, where we put people into the homes working to give uh, to give the carers respite I work with uh, the defibrillator group in Kilcommon, getting defibrillators for the community. I'm on the board of um, Belly Spillane Family Resource Centre. All these are outside of the council now. These are all my voluntary work like. And I think when you are working within the community, you build up your name, you build up your reputation, and you people will see you as a worker and that you do things for the good of the community and not for yourself. There's no uh, financial gain for me in any of those. I'm on boards that I never get a penny for. I and I even when I'm on the ETB, I've never claimed one penny for travelling to the ETB. I've I I like to do things. I like to give back to the community and I like to help the community. Since I left school, I have been involved in voluntary work. I was a scout leader. I spent 30 years, 30 years delivering meals and wheels in Killarney. And that's that's the way I got known. And I think people know that, that I am a worker. And that's why I got the vote. Having said that, now maybe I mightn't get it the next time around. <laughs> but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because I, I, I work hard. And I hope that that comes across. But for you, Caroline, I, I see where you are because I've been there and done that. And uh, you asked a while ago um, about advice when you want to go to local elections. If I had got the advice, run, but run in the other direction at the time, I thought I might have, I thought I might have taken it, but I'm so glad nobody did give me that advice because it's been a wonderful experience. It's been a wonderful journey. And uh, even if I was to never go any further, I have got so much out of it. And I hope I have given so much back to people as well. So I feel that I have done the job of work and I'm, I'm proud of what I've done. It's an honour. It's an absolute honour. Just think about it, that you go out there and you ask people to vote for you. And if it's only 100 people or if it's a thousand people, that they put their trust in you. They give you number one to say, of all the candidates that's running, you're number one for them. It's an amazing, amazing feeling. And it's, you know, even if you don't get elected to think that so many people put their trust in you. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that's, for me, where it came from. You will get your softer side across, as you call it. You will. It, it will happen for you, Caroline, because you are doing the work anyway, and people will, will think. I think if you put your name on the ballot paper in Tralee, that because this is where you work, you might, you know, you might find that that's... 
No, no, no. <laughs> I'm trying to hold on to my... Trying to kick I'm me. I'm trying to hold wondering. on to my seat. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> we, we'll keep yeah, it neutral. We have to be honest. <laughs> A little bit of honesty. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying that people would know you so much better. But, you know, you you you, you might surprise everybody and you might say, I know Nicolani is a lot better than Tree, but we will see in time. And look, the best of luck to Caroline. We'll, we'll hopefully be on the, on the concert together. Okay, thanks. Norma, would you maybe answer that as well, if you I don't mind? In relation to that question, like the, Marie yeah, I used the word empathy, and it is extremely important to be empathetic, okay? And like you, you will see within the council chamber, you'll see it in the media, there's an awful lot of theatrics involved in this job as well. You know, and uh, like I did, I, I, I have one particular person I know when I'm chairing some of our, our meetings and the motion will come up and, and it would be the most important thing. And they would say, this is the most important thing to happen. And then the very next one, and this is the most important thing to happen. So there's a, a lack of consistency around what they perceive as the most important. So it's, it, you know, there is playing to the audience. There is all of that. But it, 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 the word consistency, in my view, is one of the more important ones. Be consistent on your positions, OK? Uh, don't allow yourself to be waylaid because you will have people who come to you who want you to go one way or the other, what you actually believe in. If you have a, a perspective on, you know, how local government should be funded, uh, uh, you know, you have a position, don't allow yourself to be waylaid because I actually do think at the heel of thought, they might argue with you, but I think people respect people that stand for things, okay, and not people that flip-flop. So don't be afraid of that. And it, and that allows you then to have your soft skills. You don't have to be th overly theatrical, pretending that you're a, a tough person in this and you're you're going to take on the, the, the might of X, Y, and Z and something else. You can be who you really are in terms of how you approach people and how you deal with them, but you show your toughness uh, and you show your strength by being steadfast on policy issues and, and, and positions like that. And I, I firmly believe... You know, with all, in spite of all of the difficulties we're having with social media and maybe uh, uh, attention and the negativity around the world at the moment, people are fair at the core of it. I genuinely believe people are fair. And if you work for people and you've done your best for people, they will remember that. They honestly will. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for that insight. Any other questions? No. Um, I have another question, if that's okay. Um, when you start off, right, and you're elected or whatever, if you're successful and you are elected or whatever to the council, um, do you think it's a good idea that, you know, you kind of focus on maybe a number of key initiatives or whatever that you hope you're going to achieve maybe over a period of time in the council? Or is it sort of, you know, do you end up getting distracted or whatever, maybe with the kind of day-to-day, -day, whatever kind of items or whatever that arise? You know, if you were to give advice or whatever to someone and say, okay, look, you can't do all things at all times. You can't be all things to all people. Um, what advice would you give to people? Deirdre, I might go to you first. <clears throat> well, I'm not going to know why you're coming to me because I was actually co-opted. <laughs> I've actually never put my face in a ballot paper until this point. I was co-opted following Pad Daly's election in 2020. But what I can say is, based on the makeup of the council and following the local elections, that you are also going to have your internal elections in and around your council-appointed boards. Um, it's in those SPC uh, committees where you do have that ability to see amendments and changes to actual local government policy. And, and to carry county council policy, so to speak. But I knew when I was going in that what was very important to me was, in fact, um, the Kerry coastline, and particularly that of the Tralee MD. I live on the coastline. I'm looking at a, a natural geographic phenomenon outside my door, which is a tambola, which has been breached because of storm surges. And I just felt that that's something that was very important to me as a local representative of the Banna, Fenish, Barrow Har and Tralee Bay Harbour areas and, and the Barrow Harbour and the Tralee Bay areas. So that's something I've actively worked on throughout. I have linked in with the community groups, but it, it's something you can't start and stop. You have to continually keep working. I think Norma intimated earlier my comments outside with the journalist around 
waiting times and and I have a severe lack of patience but I have learned to manage my expectations that this is something that is going to be unfortunately years in the making because of funding first and foremost feasibility studies understanding all that before you go in is actually probably one of the best things to have um, but on top of that another thing that I highlighted at the time was um, uh, <sighs> mental health would be something I would work actively on throughout before um, it's something that's very important to me and it took four years from the time the initiative started but the connecting for life program has fully a full interagency committee between the Gardaí, Kerry County Council and the HSE and that program has come to fruition as of last week you know and it's set your mind at something you have to look I knew going in that climate change or the coastal Kerry uh, the sorry, the Tree Bay coastal erosion was very, very important to me. And that's something I'm still working on. And that's something that you just have to go in. You know what you need. You know in your local communities where you're from, you know the issues from the canvas. You know the issues um, with, through in the whole, throughout the whole county anyway. But there, that's the only way I can describe. I didn't have the plan before I went in because I was co-opted, but I knew what I wanted to see happen. So I hope that answers your question. I, I very much so and I, I it just shows as well that when you are elected I suppose the structure within the council enables you to I suppose channel your energies into particular areas that are of interest to you and um, which is a very good opportunity but well. to probably block <laughs> probably curtails you a little bit as well because to be fair and I think we have to be very honest with the people we don't have a huge level of autonomy because we're very much hindered by national policy you know, national policy influences local government policy. And we have to be very cogn cognizant mm. of that too. But I, I suppose, though, you know, say, for example, you know, the presentation earlier on, say, for example, we saw the different committees, right? So let's say you have a particular interest in something like education and training. You know, you have an opportunity maybe to participate in something like the Kerry Education Training Board. So I suppose it's probably just say that there are some avenues or whatever that would be available to you if you did have a particular kind of interest in, in an area, whatever, uh, tr through the process. Um, just one last general question, and then maybe I'm going to finish up by asking um, all of the panel or whatever a question maybe that they um, might look at. Um, Aoife, you outlined whatever at the very start of it, whatever that um, you've done your, your term, is it 10, 10 years or whatever? So um, I suppose, again, just in a form like this, just to say thank you to you for the last decade of service and, um, you know, very much, very much appreciated. And it's a big decision or whatever to, to make or whatever to say, you know, at a point in time. Um, that you know you've decided whatever not to seek um, re-election um, and uh, you know for the last um, 10 years if I suppose if I was to ask you um, if you were to say look for you yourself what was the greatest achievements you felt you achieved as a public representative to inspire others that are considering a, a role in politics I'm no great cheeks, I'm a normal human being. Um, I think, um, I don't know, uh, you know, you could name projects you've been involved in, but I think what's more probably important to me is, honestly, now I'm not just saying this is like respectful engagement. Um, you know, I could say, oh, the Dale Road, I got a fix. There was a lot of, you know, cars, and, and it was. It's important to me. I've lost someone in road traffic accidents, you know, and making our roads safer is so important. But I think, broadly speaking, you know, 10 years of service, um, I, I just can't say enough how important in the world we live in today, how how crucial it is that we can go in and debate respectfully with each other about really hard issues that we need to go in and talk about. There are, you know, a couple of really difficult issues that we need to go in and talk about nationally and internationally and in, on a European front that affect so many people on the ground for lots of different reasons. And I think um, just the most important thing we can all do for each other is go in and respectfully debate whatever it is and be able to leave the anger, the whatever outside the door and come in and and I suppose I've had ten you know I've been a solicitor for 
15 or 16 years or whatever. So I think that training to advocate has helped me, um, you know, go in and be able to kind of hopefully, you know, put together what it is I think should be said for the people I represent in a, in a respectful fashion. And I, I think respectful engagement works very well. And you, you, the council staff are really good and, and the only time you'll ever come into trouble is if you're not respectful. That, and that's when you don't get respect back. And I think once we, we can we can do anything once we go in. And, and I think if I was to leave saying anything, it would probably be that. Thanks, um, Aoife. And um, respect, privilege and trust. They're the three words that are coming up all the time, whatever is part of um, this conversation. So before we wrap up this session, right, um, same question to each of you. I'll start um, with Deirdre to my left. Um, if you were to suggest one initiative that would remove barriers or challenges that women face in terms of entering public life, what would it be? Crikey, that's a tough question. Um, it, when you're talking, are you talking local wise or? If we, if we confine it even to, um, if we even confine it to overall or whatever, I would say, you know, to encourage more representation mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, yeah so Aoife okay. will go first, yeah. yeah. I'm just trying to. Do you to want think to have time head. to think? Because just because I know, I know what I want to say about this, because the maternity leave thing was, I came in at 34 and. Um, I'm leaving at 44, lads, obviously. <laughs> and, and, and on that note, I, you know, I've kind of learned, I suppose, to come to terms over the last couple of months that there's, that there's no problem coming in for 10 years and exiting again, and that we shouldn't view it as something that has to be for life, because I think that's yeah. prohibiting people making the decision and coming into politics, and maybe particularly women. Um, and that we, sh yeah, I think there's a conversation around that to be had, you know, nationally and all that. Um, but the maternity leave, which has now changed, I think, you know, I didn't know coming in there was maternity leave. I really struggled with the fact that there wasn't. And I remember four weeks after my second child was born, I was going back to work on Jesus. This is torture now. Uh, and then I had a third one. That wasn't a good idea, but I was lucky enough to have a third child. And, and but I really struggled like and mentally and physically and pride, you know, it was really, really difficult. Um, and I think. That has been a very good change that has come about that you can hire someone, you know, to come in instead of you. Uh, and um, the online meetings have helped. Uh, so again, like if there's anyone considering it or, you know, any other women like that helps because if you do have, you know, you, like you were down as absent when you had a child, which is ridiculous. Now that's, you know, changing. And, and the council staff were fantastic to me when I had my child. But anyway, that has changed. So there, like, as much as there are, um, it still can be difficult. There have been a number of changes that are, um, that really make a difference. And yeah. Look, I'm, like I said, I'm not, my children were teenagers when I went into this game, but uh, like Aoife, I remember my sister had her baby on Friday and she was in a council meeting on Monday. And her husband walked out, was walking around with the baby because she was nursing herself. And I just thought that was shocking, you know. Um, but overall, I think I think the proxy being allowed to come in for local councillors, I think at a national level, it's always going to be, be very prohibitive because of the centralised system that we have with, uh, with Dal Aaron and the inability to send somebody in proxy, obviously. Um, and I think that's always going to be quite prohibitive. Um, initiatives overall... I suppose, <clears throat> I think what's going to be very important is we're going to have to start looking, and we discussed this outside earlier on, is that, that this job has to be considered a full-time job. Um, people are working full-time, they have a full-time income, and then they're taking up, they're, they're, they're losing some form of financial security in one respect in order to go in to do something that they... They, they're passionate about because you're not going to go into this job unless you're passionate about it. You're not even going to try and go into this job unless there's a passion. So we have to start looking at um, respecting the role that, and we, we've talked about respect. We have to respect the workload and we have to make sure that, um, that, that the councillors are able to do the job. You know, um, so I think that's probably one of the other initiatives that's probably going to be quite important. And I definitely think that some form of decentralisation. I'm very lucky that when I came in, so did lockdown. So 
part of that thing is hardly nobody knew what I looked like. <laughs> they only knew my voice. Um, but online meetings came in. And that made our, because a lot of our time would have been spent on the road, I would imagine, prior to this, because I do remember traveling with Trish in between meetings and stuff. Um, but I do think that that form of some form of decentralization at the national level, because people probably do want to go in and progress through the ranks, you know. So, look, it, it, they're, my, it, it, that they're the two that I feel that are probably very important overall, particularly for women going in. Thank you. The question, I suppose, is what, what do I think are the, the obstacles? I Yes, I, th I think the, being a counsellor needs to become a full-time job. Um, I, I effectively, I've, I've made it my own full-time job because my, the area I represent is geographically so vast um, and uh, those subcommittees that we're involved in. And I was in a position where I, I, I don't have dependents. I was able to make that choice. Uh, but if you were in a position where you had dependents, you certainly couldn't do it. On the on the part time salary that is there, you know it has to be it has to be properly paid, and then you people will be able to to do it full time, which will be good. The obstacles, so I think that is one one of the and I'm looking back again um, to one of the questions you said there about you know what you enjoyed most about it. Uh, I had the privilege of being on that subcommittee that drew up the legislation on the maternity leave. Um, and it was one of the best experiences I had in politics because it was uh, there was a group of, of councillors and senators from uh, across the, 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 the country. Uh, uh, Minister Peter Burke was actually overseeing it at the time. And uh, I, I was fortunate enough to be nominated by the Fianna Fáil Party to be on that group. And it was such a, an enriching experience. It really was. I couldn't tell you the party of the people uh, that I was on with because yeah. that did not become an issue it had no it had absolutely no part in the conversation but it was really wonderful and we met online actually we never met in person we met online over i actually ironically i think it was nine months and we produced the legislation at the end of it um uh, to, to 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 deal with maternity but that it was a really and, it, and because it was an all women uh, grouping and it was just so uh, you know instructive as to how positively things can be done when you have people focused on on doing something for the the greater good uh in terms of obstacles at national level, something I'd love to see happen uh, are term limits. I would love to see it that you could only serve two terms uh, as an Oireachtas member because I think it would totally change the outlook. It would not be about minding your seat and making sure you stay elected. It would be about using the time that you have to get things done. That, that's my top and safety work there. Marie? Uh, again, um, as I've already said, when I went into this active politics like this, um, my children were reared. I don't know could I have done it if they weren't. Uh, my husband was working full time. Uh, you you do need to be at home, like with your kids. One of you, either your my husband or myself, it wasn't always feasible because of his job that he could just take time off, and to to, to be with the kids. I mean, there's homework to be done. Do you have to have dinner for them when they come in? When, when my kids were doing, the, and I have only two, but when they were doing either a junior cert or a leaving cert, I swear to God, there seemed to be a general election on it all the time. I said, why do the elections always come? Some of the, the, the poor pets, do you know what? They, they don't sometimes, I, I, they had to cook something for themselves and try and do their, their study for their exams because Mike was director of elections for the TD and I was stuck in the office and I couldn't go. He wouldn't get home to 7 or 8 or 9 o'clock at night because letters had to go out and this had to be done. It is not easy juggle life. It really isn't. It, it, you have to find a balance. I work part-time now and I don't have kids at home I have a husband as I already said but I have to juggle my days off to attend meetings and there seems to be meetings all the time uh, you know you have your municipal district meeting you have your ETB board meeting you have the youth work that comes from on from the team it, it spreads out like it's got testicles this this council because you've got to go into different organizations and underneath all those organizations are subcommittees and you're expected to be there and that with my volunteer work it just takes a lot of juggling i think the two things is definitely childcare 
I, it didn't apply to me, but it does apply to the younger women going forward. And I do think that they will have to encounter a lot of difficulties with juggling family and meetings and, and the work. But it is surmountable and you will be able to do it with help and back up at home. It's it's uh, very important. The maternity leave, of course, is, is very important. But I do see another flip side to that as well. Because when you're on maternity leave, you're not there, you're not in work. And, and people have sharp memories. Sometimes they say, oh, she can't get her. She's gone for about six months or whatever, and she's not there. And the per maybe if a person replaces you, I'm not sure if you can co-op someone on or not under the new legislation. But if you can, suddenly they're the knight in shining armor and you're at home. You know, so it has a flip side to it. So um, one thing I would love to see, but it, that's over to the executive table over here, is that if there was... Uh, a childcare facility within the council building that you could bring your children in and they, you know, like a crash while the meetings are on and things, but um, that isn't happening in Kelly County Council anyway. But in some employments, it is happening and there are places, you know, so it might be something that is worth thinking about. And that would certainly encourage a lot of younger women with young children to come into the job and to give time to it. But um, again, we'll be looking over to the sidelines here and see if they're taking any notice of us but I think it would be a great help if there was a bit of child care for people. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, thanks, Marie. Um, and Marie, I, 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 it's actually a common theme again or whatever, you know, all of our candidates, um, all those involved whatever in, in local politics, uh, you know, they're all involved in communities and they're all involved in volunteerism or whatever, you know what I mean? It's it's like in, in people's DNA, isn't it, or whatever. So, Marie, I console myself or whatever with my children, you know, when they're cooking for themselves and sorting themselves out. I feel I'm resilience building for them. <laughs> yes, what I'm, what I'm doing. So I'm giving them life skills is what I'm doing or whatever. So make myself feel better. I, anyway. I absolutely yeah. agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> my um, son loves doing the ironing now. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, I... I'm, I'm going to wrap up the, the, the session now. Um, can I just, before I do that, um, just to say thank you very much to each and every one of you, um, our panel contributors. Um, we're fortunate um, to have uh, such a, a group of um, strong, able and resilient women that uh, represent us across the council, um, including obviously our, our um, four participants that are here or whatever today, uh, to thank Aoife for her 10-year uh, service um, and uh, to wish her well. <laughs> Um, to wish uh, the outgoing councillors uh, the best um, for the election and to, um, very importantly, um, I suppose express our thanks on behalf of all of us um, involved in our communities to everyone who is going to put their name on a ballot paper as part of a democratic process. Um, you know, it's a very brave thing to do and I congratulate everyone that's involved in that process and to wish everyone um, the absolute best um, in the um, election process. It's an exciting uh, few weeks um, that's ahead or whatever for people. So just to say uh, congratulations and coming this far and to wish everyone absolutely the best as part of the process um, and also uh, before we finish up I'll be handing over to Christy because I know he wants to say a few words but just to say thanks to Christy and to Padraig for their excellent presentation uh, today that gave us a wonderful um, and in-depth oversight in relation to the council how it works and uh, the uh, I suppose different functions and powers of the uh, councillor and I suppose clearly explaining to us uh, the role between the executive and the, and the councillors um, very very important um, information for two people uh, to have um, and also to um, our representatives from the PPN to, to Breed and to Anne-Marie um, you know again thank you very much for the insight or whatever that you shared um, and particular Anne-Marie to yourself for the enthusiasm and the uh, by which you shared it um, because it's it's uh, wonderful to see I suppose what can be achieved you know outside of being a councillor and the process or whatever from you know volunteerism and 
community engagement and so on. Um, and look, just to say again, thanks to everyone in Kerry County Council for organising this event. Um, I've been dealing uh, directly with uh, Caroline and Sean as part of the process. So look, thanks to yourselves and to all the team. I hope I'm not leaving anyone out or whatever, but to all of the team that have been involved in organising this event. Um, it's it's really it's been really very very good and very very insightful. And there's definitely quite a lot of actions I think that will come out of this event to whatever that hopefully Kerry County Council will look at in terms of uh, future um, initiatives um, and look to everyone that mobilised this event to whatever from an IT perspective to Catherine as whatever as well so just to say thank you very much um, and thanks to everyone for their time so I'll hand over to Christy I think that wants to say a few words. <laughs> Thank you, Breed. Uh, just one or two comments before we finish up. Uh, We're all in trouble. <laughs> no, uh, do you, do raising the awareness, just to point out, there's a, there's a lot of work being done on a local government sectoral basis at a national level in relation to increasing the level of awareness, and I think that'll begin to to pay off in the you know in, over the next couple of years. Uh, Padraig, in his presentation at the start, referred to the vision of you know Kerry County Council and the corporate plan. Part of it refers to leading economic, social and community development. I think, just to make the point, this really came to the fore in the last couple of years during COVID and after the COVID pandemic. And the role of local government uh, was crucial in, the, in, you know, in responding, in helping and in promoting the economic uh, recovery. And I suppose it showed to all of us the importance of local government, and it was quite inspiring for us as staff working in the system uh, to, s to see, you know, the importance of, of the, the role. So uh, just to, to make that point, uh, in relation to, I suppose, any, may, any feedback from today from, from those uh, present? If you have any thoughts subsequently, you can uh, get us at info at kerrycoco.ie or podrickcorkery at kerrycoco.ie or myself, Christy O'Connor at kerrycoco.ie. If you have any suggestions or whatever in relation to how can we develop it further. We're looking at a number of items, uh, you know, in the, in the coming period, whether before or after the local elections, but, you know, data protection, and it's an important area and uh, how you can uh, that media skills uh, health and well-being and it's possibly something we'll do after you know look into after the local elections but for, for all and maybe more the there was a lot of interest in the in the ppn process there maybe more some more uh, feedback on that uh, so look, I'd like to thank the organisers of today's event in, in, in the main. You've mentioned them. Padraig, uh, Cockery here, Sean Scally down the back, Siobhan Griffin down there, Breed O'Sullivan, uh, and marie Caroline Toll, who did a huge amount of work uh, in the area, and Brian Looney, who organised all the, the technical uh, uh, things uh, there. I'd like to thank the four councillors for, uh, it was very interesting listening to you, even, uh, uh, so it was, you know, you give very, very good insight into the role of the council. Uh, I suppose we work as a team, really, even though sometimes people look at us and the councillors versus the, the staff or whatever like that, but in the main, we're working as a team for the, for the betterment uh, of the council. Uh, I'd like to thank very much Catherine uh, in relation to the Irish Sign Language. It was very good to, to, she has been very helpful to us over the last number of years and we hope to work further with her in the future, but it was important in relation uh, to today's event. The hotel as well here for their, uh, for their uh, cooperation. And uh, I think f finally then to Breed, uh, who was chair and facilitator for today and who done a great job, uh, made it very, uh, easy to 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 present and to to sit down and answer and uh, thank you very much. So thanks very much to everybody who attended. Yeah.